a list of the non-legislative functions of the state legislature. Yes. Of course, the most important is democratic accountability. That's what the freedom movement was all about. From representative to responsible government. I made a note. Shall I pass it on and have it uploaded? On uh, on on what are the non-legislative uh, functions? Legislative functions. All right. Because that is a question of the court. You can certainly. Because that's the question. Yes. From the Upload can be. Yes. Can I hand it over? Yes. Put it as part of Mr. Yeah, can you ask a junior to email it, uh, Dr. Savan, to the court master? We'll do that. I'm obliged. Give it to Mr. Prasanna and he will upload it. All right, no difficulty. Along with the excerpts of All some right. of the All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaffer. But proceeding on the premise that lordships have gone through the yes. mission, there is one apology that I have to make, Lord, but there is one serious error in that written submission. Lord, uh, wherever I have referred to Jammu and Kashmir, please read merger as accent, not merger, because lordship has seen Kashmir did not merge. So that's the error which I have committed. I want to rectify it. Wherever I use the word in my written submission, merger in respect of Jammu and Kashmir has to be accession. Now, Lord, I'll take just two minutes to sum up the context part which the Lord just must have seen. Kashmir, Lord, uh, acceded differently because it acceded post 19 uh, August 47. The rest of the states, concluded their accession as well as standstill agreement before August 47. Because standstill agreement was a precondition for instrument of accession. So they had all signed. Kashmir did not do it. And therefore, as per the cabinet, I mean, the cabinet mission memorandum 25th May, as well as the India Independence Act 1947, Section 6 and 7 and 8. Kashmir acquired independence because the paramount to see ceased on 15th of August 47. That's the crux of the Cabinet Mission Memorandum and the India Independence Act that follows it. Yes. The rest of the states barring Kashmir merged through agreements you know, from time to time you know, with the Dominion of India, ceding all their powers, ceding all their powers and sovereignty, barring Kashmir. And that is what Lordship would notice in the instrument of accession. I would not take Lordship's word, but that is what Lordship would notice. All the states were you know, unqualified session of sovereignty to the Dominion of India. Some ceded not uh, directly to the you know, Dominion of India but states, larger ones. Some ceded to the Dominion of India while they merged with the provinces. You know? Provinces were not shipped over but the, the provinces under the Government of India Act and they automatically merged in the Dominion of India. And some ceded to the Federation of States, you know, the Union of States. But eventually, all these Seeding rulers you know, and states, Indian states. They accepted that their right to make constitution which was guaranteed to, guaranteed to them you know, in the cabinet mission memorandum and thereafter under the India Independence Act and the negotiations. They all ceded that. Constitution of India will not be the sole constitution with their constitution merging in the constitution of India. And that is what is not the genesis of Article 238. Article 238 is significant, Lord. And this will answer one of your Lordship's query, Lord, that uh, what was the status of uh, Kashmir when it ceded to the Dominion under Article 1 and the schedule. Where will we get Article 238 actually? 
where will we get the because our constitution copy doesn't carry it so if i'll just check not not lack i doesn't have in this yes i'll i'll share it with justice squad is it anyway in the compilations in the compilations do we have it somewhere i have copies of this but i i brought copies of the anyway no it doesn't worry we have it here you all rely heavily on mr shankar <laughs> So very adept at these well, things. Uh, we are the not... constitution uh, as applicable to the state of JNK have that? I'm sorry, no. Will the constitution as applicable to the state of JNK have that? No. 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 Two thirty eight is in the constitution of India, and it so can't, no. it can't have it because it's barred. That's yeah, it. that's that's why. No, I am coming to that. I'm coming to that as a okay, slight nice uh, something to be said. Lordships would keep bear this in mind that Kashmir ceded and became part of Union of India as part B state. And all the ruler states were part of part B state. I mean they were all part B in the schedule, first schedule. And therefore, 238 was made applicable to part B states only, which were Indian states. Two thirty eight only what two thirty eight does was it keeps the promise of applying the state's constitution to the government to the union I mean the, the constitution of India. Part B state two thirty eight says that part six, seven, and consequently part eleven will also apply to these part B states. And that is how not all these Indian states not merged unconditionally into the constitution of India. Initially, all the Indian states were promised that they will have their constitution. But then, through negotiations, this was taken out. My old vision wasn't. Yes. Now, the status of Devo Kashmir was of a Part B state in the year 1950 when the constitution was enacted. And yet, Lordship would notice in 370, Article 238 was excluded. That speaks volumes about the autonomy of the state. Yes. Therefore, I just hand these up. You know, these. Are these given on a returnable basis no, or on a no, non-returnable basis? That's for the court. In fact, when we were arguing Boilo's matter, we were looking for Article 31 and it wasn't in the footnotes. So when we conceived this constitution, we had to put all the old provisions. So you but the only discrimination my friend has practiced is I have been divorced. You want me to have a later edition of this? It's coming out in three days. But the, the original, the intention to give me was not there. <laughs> Atani is very upset that Atani has been discriminated against. <laughs> so now you have mine, I have one. The copy, I can carry it with my own copy. Our brother has another, his own copy. So. I have my copy. Yeah. No, the Tony should be penalized for gifting us all. <laughs> <laughs> now coming back to the... Now, but this brief not the introduction was necessary because the basic theme of ours is that the Kashmir was entirely different. And this is what Lordship would notice in the debate suits. So, all vanity, no fun. Kashmir was different, not both in respect of accession to the Dominion of India when it ceded at a different point of time as an independent state 
our nation. And it was different in the sense that it did not merge unlike the other states. It's sovereignty. And that is why we did not put not notice in the instrument of accession, which was negotiated by Kashmir, the ruler. ruler. There are a couple of clauses which are not there in the other instruments of the accession. Format is the same under 1936 government of 35 government of India Act, but the conditions which were added in favor of Kashmir were not there. For instance, we are not bound by any provision of the constitution of India, future constitution of India. The internal sovereignty was in the ruler. The, you know, the Union of India cannot acquire land in Kashmir. Kashmir would acquire for Union of India and give it. Now, not from here, not noticing these important issues, you know, just may just I'd, I'd like to answer Lordship's query, which fell from one of the Chief Justice. No? The sovereignty aspect. And which eventually will answer you not know, Justice Khanna's query also, the superior and inferior constitutions. Eventually. Now, but the first aspect that we have to keep in mind is. His sovereignty was retained by the Raja in the instrument of accession. Lordship has seen that, you know, so I would not waste Lordship's time. Now, the concept of sovereignty is a variable concept, Lord. Concept where it was in the 19th century, 18th century was no longer there in the 20th and 21st century. When the Lord written constitution started in and the democratization of Autonomy, as my friend puts it, no? I, I, that's a very yeah. phrase pregnant with meaning. Democratization of authority no? and power, which is autonomy. The sovereignty being a variable factor has two components no? the internal and the external, and there are two decisions which lots of men no? just care to note. No? One is Lord 1953, 1953, Pepsu, PSU, full bench, Lord, which deals with a similar situation where Patiala as an estate not uh, merged with British Paramount Sin. Then what was the position of sovereignty of the Raja? The page, Mr. Devery. Page. You can give us page later, no problem. You can just have me back. 739. What is the principle no, no, which sorry, it lays down? I'm sorry, not uh, this. 1953, Pepsu 1. But I'm sorry, not this confusion arises. No, not... it's AIA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it in the, any compilation? Yeah. Uh, case case yes. law compilation? Yes. Which says the sovereignty comprises of two parts. Mainly because you have ceded external sovereignty, defense, external affairs, and communication, it would not amount to seeding of internal sovereignty. And what is the second judgment? The second judgment not is uh, a recent judgment, 2000, volume 8, SCC 61. You repeat the citation, please. 2000, volume 8, 8 SCC, SCC, page 61, paragraph 31 and 2. Paragraph? 31 and 2. 31, 31 and 31. And where was in the compilation, where did you get it? But I'm sorry, it's not there in the compilation okay. because this, it's easy later to get research not yielded all these. Uh, page 61. I've given and I don't have time. If I... And the third judgment in this regard, which you know, uh, is a clear pointer towards where the sovereignty rests, 
post constitution note the internal sovereignty that is 59 supreme court p and paul volume 1 page 8 pdf page eight. we have seen that yes That's the situation with regard to sovereignty. You know? It's not that uh, Kashmir lost all, all sovereignty merely because it acceded. And neither inclusion in the Article 1 and the schedule would result in loss of you know, internal sovereignty. Now, but, uh, the key part of my argument is based on, and the question which I am, the key question which I am raising is, that three, Article 370 ceases to operate once the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was enacted on 26th of January 1957. Now, it is somewhat different from what most of my friends have argued. They want some part of 370 to survive post-57. My argument is nothing survives. All the powers conferred under Article 370, I would show broad, cease to operate once the Constitution is enacted. And in that context, we have to keep in mind the object of 370 and the commitments made by the Dominion of India then and the approval of those commitments by the framers. But we must bear in mind that the people governing the Dominion of India were mostly the same who were the, who were the framers of our constitution. And they were wise men. We always say framers were most wise, dynamic, and sagacious. But then when it comes to the commitment made by them, not we forget their sagacity. And therefore, I would pray, please permit me to place the debate you know, of Dr. Iyengar, you know, that is most crucial for my argument, and juxtapose it with 317, Lord, then I'll show one by one, Lord, all of the provisions become osios. So this is something which is a must for my argument, and I'll pray, please permit me. Instead of reading uh, us reading now Mr. Iyengar's uh, debate, know, that, uh, debate and his, his address, because we've read it three or four times. If you can call out, and we'll take it down, if you can call out what are the key parts of I, what he said. So that, and then we we'll go on to 370. Right. The debate, if Lord Chibuti, the initial part says that Article 370, Clause 1, B1 and 2, these are provisions providing for consultation and concurrence of the government of Jammu and Kashmir. And it clearly says, debates clearly say, that this was an interim arrangement till the Constituent Assembly was constituted. Now what does, with due respect, I submit not to ask myself, what does this interim arrangement mean in respect of 1B, 1 and 2? If it was an interim arrangement, they said it is interim vis-a-vis -vis clause 2, which says, as soon as the Constituent Assembly comes into being, the final decision is that of the Constituent Assembly. With regard to A, the jurisdiction of Union and Parliament over Kashmir, And the union's relations with the state, or state's relation, conversely, the state's relation with the union. So the first is jurisdiction of union of India over Jammu and Kashmir. And second, I'm sorry, but I can. You said once the constitution of JNK comes into being, the final decision is that of the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, which was formed for. Framing of the Constitution Clause 2 says on two aspects. You say one jurisdiction of Union of India over Jammu and Kashmir and the center and the state relations. The finality would be that imparted by the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir.
I'll place only those portions you know, from the debate which you know, unerringly lead to that. All right, let's quickly see those. Yeah. Uh, if you can just give us the page uh, reference. Who oh, apna who oh, laminated the dishes? Are... Kindly come to note the volume five, EDF page seventy nine. I'm reading note the volume five, page seventy nine. Note I'm reading the internal page four two four. We just go to that in a second. I've lots of content too. Just one second. Kiss me, man. What is the page? That is volume. Now the page first part. You are in the right document, but uh, volume page 79. The first part, of course, deals with the different situation of Kashmir, which resulted in this discriminatory treatment of Kashmir, in favor of Kashmir. Then kindly come to the last paragraph. Last paragraph of that very page. No? Again, the classic begins like this. No? Again, the government of India have committed themselves to the people of Kashmir in certain respects. They have committed themselves to the position that an opportunity would be given to the people of the state to decide for themselves whether they will remain with the Republic or wish to go out of it. That was the, not the extent of right given. But let's keep that aside for a moment. Then last three lines, last three lines of the paragraph, last four minutes. We have also agreed that the will of the people through the instrument of a constituent assembly will determine the constitution of the state as well as the sphere of Union jurisdiction over the state. That's a very clear indicator. No? Sphere of union jurisdiction over the state will be determined by the constituent assembly. Lord Lordships have gone through it. My friends skipped through it, but then the important aspects have remained uncovered. No? Therefore, I was. Then kindly come to the next paragraph, which is even more significant. No? And this represents clause 1b, 1 and 2. At present, the legislature which was known as Praja Sabha in the state is dead. Because the situation was such in Kashmir at that point of time, well, nothing could be functional. Neither that legislature nor the constituent assembly can be convoked or can function until complete peace comes to prevail in that state. We have therefore to deal with the government of the state which as a representative, uh, which represent, no, Brilliant. as represented in its council or of ministers reflects the opinion of the largest political party in the state. Till the constituent assembly comes into being, only an interim arrangement is possible and not an arrangement it could be brought into line with the arrangement that exists in case of other states. Now the word interim arrangement follows their elaboration that neither the constituent assembly is convoked nor the legislative assembly is there under the 39 constitution which is Prajasapa. Therefore whom should we consult? We are forced to consult or get the concurrence of the government which is the only representative body till the constituent assembly comes. But this leaves no room for doubt with regard to 1B1, 1B2 and even 1D I'll show. All those provisions which provided for consultation and concurrence with the government of India, sorry, government of Kashmir, cease to operate till the, so operate only till the constituent assembly is not there. No sooner it comes into being, it sees to. Then Lord, the next paragraph, which is a short paragraph, further corroborates that impression. 
and it further indicates that 306A is also a temporary provision. Not all this argument, not that it has become permanent. We are giving meaning to the word temporary used in the constitutional provision, the what's the context, the object. Please have this. Now, if you remember the viewpoints that I have mentioned, it is an inevitable conclusion that at the present moment, we could establish only an interim system. 306A is an attempt to establish such a system. Now, what else does temporary provision mean? It's an interim provision. They're saying it in so many words. And yet, what we are trying to do is make it permanent, changing the entire text of the Constitution. No, no, 306 lordships, no. Sure, I mean, sorry. For a second, the Constituent Assembly is always regarded by us as the most august assembly ever in the history of our assembly, and they evolved the constitution. 
they were men who fully knew what constitution means when they say you know the kashmir would frame its own constitution they could have not implied anything else except what they were doing all right we now take this point of yours based on those two uh, extracts from right. Mr. gopal swami and right. i got speak now uh, you still want to refer to further something here in his yes, yes. all right look can you have not omit the next paragraph lord that is 238 so i am not i have already elaborated so yes. then come lord to the next one what the paragraph the second portion of this article relates to the legislative authority of parliament over the jammu and kashmir state this is governed primarily by the instrument of accession broadly speaking that legislative power is confined to three subjects of defense foreign affairs and communication but as a matter of fact these broad categories include a number of items which are listed in the instrument of accession i believe the number some 20 to 25 now these items have undergone a change in the description in numbering in arrangement as amongst themselves in list 1 and list 3 but this is the justification of putting list 3 in 371b now these items no i'm sorry it is therefore necessary that the items mentioned in the instrument of taxation should be brought into line with the change designation of the entries in list 1 and 3 of the new constitution so clause 1b of article 306a says that this listing of the item as per the uh, terms of the new constitution should be done by the president in consultation with the government of the state then can we come to clause b2 that is for concurrence clause b2 refers to possible additions to the list in the instrument of accession and these additions could be made according to the provisions of this article with the concurrence of the government of the state the idea is that even before the constituent assembly meets can you notice again the same thing comes the idea is that even before the constituent assembly meets it may be necessary in the interest of both the center and the state that certain items which are not included in the instrument of accession would be appropriately added to the list in that instrument so that administration legislation and executive action might be further and as this may happen before the constituent assembly meets the only authority from whom we can get consent for the addition is the government of the state now if i am not read this and if i draw an inference from this the only inference is that even b2 or all those provisions where concurrence is required of the government or consultation is required of the government for adding anything to the instrument of accession whether in terms of list items or in terms of other provisions all the provisions of consultation and concurrence were in terrain till the constituent assembly meets this can we just, just also read the next clause the I'm... last clause refers to and does the constituent assembly when it is referred to in the last sentence of that clause is yeah, an indication I... that the constituent I'm assembly reading. may continue it's at page 427 internal page no, i'll come to that please bear with me no, i'll explain that i'll explain i have that in mind but i'll bear and with, whether the constituent assembly when used in the last sentence of that paragraph yes, yes. will it be in the, in the indication that in probably that favor, probably the constituent assembly over here was meant to get prolonged also i i answer that then having seen this one that the consultation and concurrence were only for a temporary period till the constituent assembly comes into being and that is what lordship may now fall back on the article 370 clause 2 370 clause 2 now what this submission of mine tends to show to lordship's note that both the provisos again provide for consultation and concurrence 
because they governed clause 1b to 1d and therefore no sooner the constituent assembly as per the intent of the framers comes into being they would continue to operate because that's the only agency left for consultation and concurrence but once it comes then the consultation and concurrence has to be with the constituent assembly that is what clause 2 says uh, Mr. Dwedi, I don't want to rush you. We started at 10.40 today. The time allotted to you is still 11.25. We are now about 11.12. So you'll have to, everybody will have to stick to time today. So I don't, I am, I'm obliged to you. Lordship has granted me this much of time, but please bear in mind, if I'm saying something which has already been said, Lordship will stop me. But if some, there's something which perhaps is new yes. or different. All that I'm saying is we need not read now the rest of Mr. Iyengar. I'm not. No, no. But the, the Iyengar statement is relevant because it answers Lordship's query as well as not the inferiority and superiority of the Constitution of India. Also, I'll show. That so speech you have to... read at least twice, twice. I will try. That speech you have read at least twice, twice before. <laughs> But your and your contention really is that once the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was framed on 26th of January 1957, the entirety of 370 ceases to exist. There's nothing left. No. And then the only governing document is the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. Jammu and Kashmir. We, we got the point because no, they, they, they'll have to answer no, that. We cannot ignore the fact what was the commitment made. No, when we see 370, it has to be in the light of the commitment made to the now, people of Kashmir. Now, uh, Mr. Dwedi, uh, can we go to Article 370 because in, uh, you would like to dovetail this uh, speech what? with what? Uh, 370. Kindly have Lord 371. 371, yes. A. First, the heading is temporary provision. Under the heading temporary provision, which are the features of 370, which according to you would indicate that it would cease to exist after the constitution of JNK has been framed? Which are those? We you can it, just identify them. We read the debates and dovetail it over here, not it will be apparent. Yes. Not 238, not the provisions of 238 shall not apply in relation to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This provision has ceased to exist in the constitution of India from 1957 onwards. But it has not been changed for the reason that there is no power to change it. Clause 3 requires constituent assembly, clause 2 requires constituent assembly. And therefore, what my friend was right, Mr. Dha Dr. Dhawan, when he said 52 onwards, clause 3 has not been used. 238 is an amendment to Article 370, the 370, therefore, clause 3 was the only provision available. And it has not been used and it is allowed to exist because there is no way you can change it. Because for 370, you have to, to amend 370, you have to fall back on clause 3. Yeah, they have to. But they can't because the precondition for exercise of power is there. Now, Lord Tally, have Lord B, 1B, 1. That is a one-time power note. There's no dispute about that. Once you determine which are the entries relating to instrument of accession, power ceases to operate. But yet it continues. No one has deleted that. Again, the same logic. Then comes 1B2. Such other matters in the said list with the concurrence of the government of India, not government of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, reading the blood, the, the Statement of uh, Dr. Iyengar, no? which I placed for much. This is an interim arrangement because at that point of time, there was no other authority to consult or concur. Until the Constituent Assembly comes into being. And that is why two comes in. Lord, even I'll go to the extent of saying, Lord, Lordship would see logically clause C also ceases to operate. Article 1, it says the provisions of Article 1 
of this constitution shall apply in relation to the state. Reason being blurred, 370, you know, when the constitution comes, it itself says we are in inalienable part of India. And for the federation purpose, article 1 was there. So we can read both the things, statements together. There is really no need to go fall back on C. Lordship has seen not uh, section 3 of JNK constitution, including the preamble, loudly pronounces me inalienable. And this provision, not at section 3, cannot be modified under 147, section 147, which is the mandatory power of the constituent assembly. So it's a basic feature of that constitution, therefore, which is not prone to amendment. That position is settled. Now comes not D. Such of the other provisions of this constitution shall apply in relation to that state, subject to such ex exceptions and modifications as the president may by order specify. Now this Lord immediately reflects to the seven, reflects to Lord, or uh, refers to the second proviso. First proviso I have already shown is the same thing as 1B1, where the word consultation and concurrence itself is embedded in the provision. So it's more or less reiteration of that. Second proviso says, no such order which relates to matters other than those referred to in the last preceding proviso shall be issued except with the concurrence of the government. And Lordship has seen Lord, the very initial part of a concurrence and consultation was brought in only because there was no other authority. And therefore they said until the constitution, constituent assembly comes into being. So therefore in my opinion, Lord, humble opinion, subject to what comes of society usually. Even one D becomes ocious, that power cannot be excised because the concurrence now has to be by the constituent assembly. It cannot be, and that is what T2 says. If the concurrence of the government of the state referred to in paragraph 2 of sub clause B of clause 1 or in the second proviso to sub clause D of that clause be given before the constituent assembly for the purposes of framing of the constitution of the state is convened, it shall be placed before such assembly for such decision as we take. Therefore, the, even the concurrences and you know, the consultations that have resulted into something, the finality of decision is vested in the constituent assembly. It can overturn that concurrence. And that is what the framers say in respect of clause 2, that the finality for determining the status of union and the state relations, as well as the jurisdiction of parliament, rests in the constituent assembly. <laughs> Who will finally determine these things? Well, Constituent Assembly would finally determine through the shape of Constitution of India, Jammu Kashmir. It can't finally determine otherwise. Final determination has to be the enactment of Constitution, which was done. That is why I wanted to place the other paragraphs now, where they have said this in so many words, the final determination would be that of constituent assembly in respect of parliamentary jurisdiction over the state and the union's relations with the state. Clause 2 does not give finality to the decision of no, the... I'm not saying, as I said, please juxtapose the provision with the debate. With the debate. And the debate says that. So, in other words, we'll be reading an ingredient of finality from the constituent assembly debate. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll ask myself. How can that be? Lord, I, if the debate says that's the combat one, because Jammu and Kashmir constituent assembly will determine the constitution, what is the use of the commitment Lord, made? And what is the use of the constitution when it cannot finally lay down anything? 
just look at it this way bro unless we see 370 in the light of the commitment made and the commitment was to framing of the constitution but i can we say that a speech or an address made by an individual member of the constituent assembly however weighty represents a commitment by the nation or the dominion of india to the state of jammu and kashmir But this would have a bearing on the interpretation of the constitution of the so this is not when we try to see but for us to raise it to the point where it's a binding commitment a speech by a very distinguished member of the constituent assembly represents a binding commitment of a nation but that statement is not by any member that was a statement on behalf of the you know, the, the the person who answers all the queries on the amendments made that's a difference so very what you are asking us to read into it is something which is not there in the article what Not but if if the article was that this article will be get frozen in point of time after the constituent assembly of jk jnk frames the constitution that doesn't appear to be following because that's why i said come to page 427 and that makes it very clear let's let's because you are reading we can't read a portion of the debate without ex- going through the entire uh, philosophy what has been the said. last paragraph and i'll explain not not the last yes the last claim the last clause the just read that. this article yes just read that you can't the read effect. because you can't read portions the host the other because no. when uh, when yeah, yeah. debate is going on uh, there can be statements and then the explanation to those statements now not may i answer it in this way and the other part is you see once you become a part of the nation become part of the is the entire nation then you are part no, of this is what is creating a problem lord are are perhaps thinking in the manner which we have been tuned to think for last 70 years lord is that one nation one constitution but where is that prescribed lord i ask myself accepting it could be prescribed in the constitution of india but constitution does not say so. anyway just read that paragraph i the effect of this article is that jammu and kashmir state which is now part of india will continue to be part of india no no the one before that uh, the last clause refers to what right. may happen right. later on the last clause refers to what may happen later on we have said article 211a will not apply to jammu and kashmir this is article 238 but that cannot be a permanent feature of the constitution of the state and hope it will not be so the provision is made that when the constituent assembly of the state has met and taken its decision both on the constitution of the state and on the range of federal jurisdiction over state can you notice that state the president may on recommendation of the constituent assembly issue an order that the article 3 and say 6a shall either cease to be operative or shall be operative only subject to such exceptions and modifications as may be specified by him now lord i ask myself this read, question just read further in the yeah. last paragraph there but before he issues any order of this kind the recommendation of the constituent assembly will be a condition precedent correct now read the next paragraph also very well. the effect of this article is that the jammu and kashmir state which is now part of india will continue to be part of india will be a unit of the future federal republic of india and the union legislature will get jurisdiction to enact laws on matters specified either in the instrument of accession or by later additions with the con- concurrence of the government of the state and steps have to be taken for the purposes of convening the constitution do not should we not detach one line before the succeeding line it says concurrence of the government and then effort should be made to establish the constitution of india so this is what and in the jammu and kashmir amrit constituent assembly now lord if you lord should would read it with the first part and this part not after all this they are elaborating so we can't detach the first part from the last part so we are not be with due respect lord we cannot snatch away this part lord steps have to be taken for the purposes of convening the constituent assembly in due course which will go into matters i have already referred to in other words lord all this is talking again of that interim period 
the concurrence and otherwise not the first part says concurrence ceases till the constitution comes into constituent assembly comes into being and if we read later part as saying that no it will still continue that there's a contradiction to that and therefore not my cohesive reading shows that perhaps when they gave this not the uh, this power of um, not consultation and concurrence to the government it was in a peculiar situation not beyond that and that is the key as i said not that was the key to indicate what was the scope of 1b1 and 1b2 including 1d the two provisos and it's nobody's case not two and not clause three survive beyond 1970 not 57 After the Constituent Assembly took its decision on 26th of January 1957, the Dominion of India would have no power to apply any other provisions of the Constitution to Jammu and Kashmir. They have all the powers. As I said, Lord, if you Lordship would see the 44th Amendment, which is the basis for the Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, that, that, that gives not Union of India all the entries not, which it has under the Constitution of India. 1 to 96. Excepting 97 is not there because residuary power is there with the state. Section 5. That was not, not, I am not here to judge whether they were right or wrong. I am here only indicating to your lordships not that this is one of the intents clearly falling from the interpretation which they had given to 370 only. And we have always argued, not we have always said, Look into the debates to call out the intent of the provision. So all that I am saying is kindly look into the debates to call out the intent of 370. And when we see in the debates along with 370, it clearly emerges that his power is not available thereafter. And that is where I submit with respect, Lord Sampat Kumar is wrong. Lord Chipe, I have indicated in my written Sampat Prakash. And the, the, the biggest mistake committed by Sampat Prakash of Lord Chibuchi is they relied upon 1952 presidential order, which incorporates you know, that the explanation, the Lord Chibuchi 370 explanation, that was what was incorporated by Sampat Prakash, modified. Initially, it was the dynastic rule that the president will recognize the Daja as Southern Ariasa. But 52 blood, the constituent assembly blood, um, moved a motion and abolished this dynastic rule and said now Sadre Riyasat would be elected, elected by the assembly or the on the advice of the government of Jammu and Kashmir. Now blood, this was sent to the government of India with the concurrence of the Constituent Assembly under Clause 3, 370. And it was incorporated in the form of an explanation to one that Sadhere Riyasat would be. Now, Lord, the Sampat Prakash assumes that this 52 order, Lord, continues the Sadhere Riyasat and therefore it shows that they wanted permanence to 370. But they were, they erred in one respect and something which was not pointed out to them. Kindly have section 27 of the Jammu and Kashmir Act. Sir, Devedi, your submission is that uh, defunct provision of the constitution, 370 was the defunct provision of the constitution. No purpose in having it there, yet it continued to be there. Everything would be determined by JNK constitution. I'll, I'll answer that. COs have been issued from time to time, pre-57 and post-57. And yet, uh, nobody thought about it. Yet, the so called affiliation with 370, a section of the people feel, was also negatory. So, nothing survived. Lord, may I permit me, uh, please permit me to answer it's this? Difficult this to go which that has far. From your lordship, not that the past practice is going to justify the invalidity of that. Past practice. That's not the law. Laws, as I understand, is howsoever long the past practice may be, if it is constitutionally illegal, then it cannot be justified. And I'll show, not, uh, not here, kindly have section 27 of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution. It is volume 20. 
not howsoever much we may not like it no we may not approve it but the fact remains all that i am trying to show is the intent and should we read article 370 do us the intent not that's my question so we read an intent based on the constitution law debates about but how we for the how it transpired after that how it is worked out is You say the relevant complete. That's why I said not any amount of illegality or action that may have been taken subsequently cannot justify the invalidity. Once it is, I'll show. Yes, what do you want? Questions can never be not the. Which volume do you want us to see now? Yes, kindly have not volume twenty. Page. What page would that be? PDF page three one zero. Page three one zero. PDF page not three one zero. But I know, Lord, I am uh, advocating a cause which may not sound very. <laughs> I mean, in fact, which may not sound. No, no, it's not that. It's of, not that. Please. I was I, conscious I, of it. I, I know. Uh, you see, the explanation which was added in nineteen fifty two refers to the Council of Ministers. I'll answer that. It refers to the but it doesn't refer to the Constituent Assembly. It does, and it doesn't. It doesn't refer to the Constituent Assembly. Explanation. And it defines the expression "government of the state" for the purpose of that article. Yes. It defines the expression "government of the state" for the purpose of that article. And that is with the concurrence of and, Constituent. And 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 there there lies the distinction between the Constituent Assembly debates because Constituent Assembly debates was not is are not relevant as far as the explanation is concerned. That's not correct. This is what I am saying. Kindly have section twenty-seven. But well, this Sadre Riyasat in that form continued yes, under cons Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. One thing I am finding difficult to accept. You know, persuade is that I know not that it is difficult. Uh, no, I am saying so that uh, the the Constituent Assembly debates amounted to an assurance that three zero six A or three seventy would dissolve itself. I am not saying that. And whether after that it did or not, it has dissolved itself. No, no, that's 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 not right way of putting my question. Not my answer. If you say three seventy, no, I I answer the statute that. that it dissolves itself. No, what I am saying is no. What I am saying is not. Debates indicate the intention behind three seventy and the scope of three seventy because it's very common. Not every time when we see this, not uh, want to investigate and go into the question of intention of the framework. I thought you said three seventy doesn't exist. According to you, it's yes, only yes. on paper. It doesn't. Post ninety seven. Post fifty seven. Yes, yes. So I am saying what you say is the constitution debate should be read in a manner that three seventy would intend to dissolve itself on the constituent assembly uh, completing its uh, the J N K constituent assembly completing the process, no, and it has inadvertently remained on the statute over which some people that, seem to that, be very. But uh, let me say better words. Feel very strongly about three seventy. Fair deal. Lordships. Lordships would have. I am putting to you the consequence. I am putting to you the consequence. What would happen? No, were we to accept what you are saying? But this is what I am only trying to point out. I ask it. myself, Lord, I don't feel that there would be any adverse consequence. Lord, once we accept, please, please keep this in mind for a moment, Lord. That yes, two constitutions could have separately existed cohesively. Lord, but what will be the consequence? I ask myself, Lord. And that was the intent of the framers, and they felt, Lord, eventually Kashmiris may agree to something which is like other states, but then they didn't enforce that. They still permitted constitution to be framed, but constitutions are not made for a day. Lordships have held in twenty-seven sections. The, the the net consequence would be that the constitution of India, in its application to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, would stand frozen as of January nineteen fifty-seven. Therefore, no further development in Indian constitutional law. Can at all apply according to you to the JNK concept, exactly. the state of Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir after 1957? Because constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. How can that be acceptable? I, 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 we may ask this question how, but the question is which provision of the constitution permits that except 370? Now, if I am right in my submission, the 370 ceases to operate. Then which provision? Other provision would would that? But if Article 370 ceases to operate and Article 1 continues to operate. And then Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India. Surely, the jurisdiction of every uh, democratically elected institution in India is not excluded in its application. What I am saying here again, not let me reiterate. There has to be then a provision in the Indian Constitution 
which excludes its application to Jammu and Kashmir, and there is none, then according but to your argument. This may be our wish. But the point is, let us look at the provisions of the Constitution. This is what I am saying. So the very in fact, 70, in fact, your argument now cuts across the other side argument. That's right, no. They the are other side argument that. itself. <laughs> you're, you're cutting. Are, you're are, cutting at, no, but you see, and, there's a and, difference. And just look at the second proviso. Just turn to the second proviso. Yes. Except with the concurrence of that government. Now the government has been defined, uh, and the argument of your side, uh, some of your colleagues on your side, is government and the government of the day, council ministers, is different from the constituent assembly and the legislative assembly. No, this is where... and, and here, the second proviso does not use the expression constituent assembly. It says, con except with the concurrence of that government. And okay. government has been defined by, by first yeah. to the amendment in 1982. Yeah. And therefore, your 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 challenge or uh, to the dictum in uh, Sampath Kumar is slightly it gets into difficulty because I, that's the intent behind it. May I answer that? No? When it says that government, what it means is the government which was preceding the constituent assembly. That's it can't be any other government because that's then can, that's contrary to the explanation. I'll, I'll answer. But can you bear with me? Why, why do I say so? After second proviso, there is clause two. And what does clause 2 say? Whatever concurrence has been given prior to constituent assembly has to be placed before constituent assembly for enabling it to take a final decision. What it means is this, that if there is concurrence, because initially when the article 370 was there, it was Sadr Arias and uh, the, the, the other council. After that, at that time, if any decision is taken, it will be but with that. The asset continued. I know, I'm aware, but the explanation which is added is with regard to then the Council of Ministers. The explanation in 1952, which was added by the concurrence of the Constituent Assembly, was with regard to the there's, Council of Ministers. No, there's no difficulty, Lord. We are reading little, with due respect, Lord, we are reading too, little too much on that. Because have section 27 to 32. It is the Lord Sadre Riyasat elected by the Legislative Assembly who will be the Sadre Riyasat. And obviously the recommendation goes through the Council of Ministers, not otherwise. So the Council of Ministers and Sadhare Riyasat as well as Legislative Assembly are all there, elected. Yeah. And then not by explanation, by explanation, relying on the explanation to 1952 order, we cannot say in 57, Lord, Constitution does not seize 370, Lord, that doesn't follow because Constitution includes Sadhare Riyasat. The continuance of Sadhare Riyasat had to be as per section 27, it couldn't be, and that was the fact. So this assertion in Sampant Kumar, not relying upon the 52 presidential order, adding the explanation of elected Sadhare Riyasat is not correct. Not, there are lots of misconceptions, for instance, not in Damanu's case, which uh, I think one of my friends may have cited that. Lord, please read clause 2 in the debates, Lord. Please read clause 2 in the debates, Lord. Lord, may I pay here? Lots of clarification would be there if your Lordship would read the explanation to clause 2 in the debates, Lord. Page 427, the same page. Page 82. Then we come to clause 2. The passage is not paragraph. Then we come to clause 2. You will remember that several of these clauses provide for concurrence of the government of Jammu and Kashmir and the uh, Jammu and Kashmir state. Now these relate particularly to matters which are not mentioned in the instrument of accession and it is one of our commitment to the people of people and the government of Kashmir that no such addition should be made except with the consent of the constituent assembly which may be called in the state for framing of the constitution. In other words, what we are committed to is that these additions are matters for the determination of the constituent assembly. 
that explains not lot ship's uh, question it may be one to second explanation but it comes before clause 2 after reading the explanation in the clause 1b2 1d they come to clause 2 no otherwise not the whole reasonable clause not the sequence denoted in the article 370 has no meaning then and this not paragraph includes the second proviso clearly so inferring something different from that word that government not to me lord as i see it not it doesn't follow and then also the next paragraph is equally not the, uh, so far as the other thing is uh, con yes let just one paragraph no now you will recall that in some of and that has been done that we have read now, Lord, as I said, Sampath Kumar was not, Prakash was not rightly decided. And if you'll also could just have a look at Sampath Prakash, Lord, that perhaps may eventually conclude my argument. Sampath Prakash is? Which is the provision of the JNK constitution equivalent to Article 245 or 246? They have their own Section 5 which defines the powers of both state and indirectly the parliament. Section 5 in Ochita. And this is what continued for a long period of time. And you know, if practice is relevant, not, then this is continued for a long period of time till Lord, this order comes. Can we have Section 5? That is not uh, for lots of convenience, but volume 2, PDF page. I may first refer to the preamble. Now, see the the problem with your argument because article 5 says that the legislative and executive power of the state would extend to all matters except those with respect to which parliament has power to make laws for the state yes yes I like to the provisions of the constitution of india yes, yes. I like therefore that takes us to the constitution of india no, the reason being that therefore postulates that the constitution of india does apply to the state of jammu and kashmir that, that overlooks one important factor and that is the 44th amendment immediately preceded with the concurrence of constituent assembly where they had elaborately defined what are the provisions of the constitution of india would be applicable to jammu and kashmir and this constitution is elaborately based on that 44 order and therefore it presumes whatever power has been given to the parliament under not the scheme of things 44 their not what they have indicated is entries one two 96 of list one but unless I'll, 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 unless I'll, I'll, we unless for the purpose of the argument of this side unless we accept that article 370 did continue until 2019 there would no, there would be absolutely no trammel on the jurisdiction of parliament under section 5 not as i said not because 5 says except those with respect to which parliament has power to make laws for the state under the provisions of the constitution but there's not a now, I'll under the Constitution, where, but for 370, yes, yes. Parliament would have the power to make laws with respect to all aspects in List 1 and List 3. Now, if your argument no, is that 370 no, goes, no, the moment we come to then this, where is the limit on the power of Parliament? I'll answer. I'll answer. It has, Parliament has power to make laws. Now, let us fall back to that stage. What was the power given to Parliament at that point of time to make laws? The 44th presidential order, 48th presidential order, which is 1954, it elaborately determines what is the scope of parliamentary jurisdiction, that is entry 1 to 96. Now, if we add entry 97 to that again, because that is parliament's power, then what will be the fate of section 5? But then you've been arguing all, all this while that these constitutional orders are a matter of constitutional practice. 
they are contrary to the provisions of uh, the they they are contrary to the constitutional provision. No, we if we to. accept your argument and therefore don't look at the constitutional orders, then this is the consequence which follows as a, as a sequitur of your argument that there would be no restraint on the power of parliament then. The sequitur is this, Lord, that after the you know, 1954 order, there couldn't have been any other order. And that is why they say in respect to which parliament has power to make law. Otherwise not, again I fall back on the same theory, internal sovereignty continued with the state. The constitution ensures that internal sovereignty, there is a not the whole legislative provision, the executive provision and the judicial provision. So what is the utility of that law if 370 continues to infiltrate? As I said, not add entry 97, that is the residuary power. Then what remains of this? And yet the commitment was there. But all that I am suggesting time and again is see it in the light of the object of 370. The intent, the object of 370 was only to ensure that no one from outside interferes with the constitution making. That was the object of 370 as the framers have you know, delineated. So therefore, not otherwise, what should we see? 254 doesn't so apply. Devedi, now I think we've we've really understood your perspective. Can we now wrap up? Uh, yes, yes. So Sampat Kumar, I've already indicated. You've already uh, argued Sampat Kumar. So we'll now. Uh, we, there's some people who have to follow now. It is wrong. Thank you so much, Mr. Devedi. Thank you very much. No, there's one aspect. Exactly. There's one aspect which I want to throw light on, no? which fell from Lord Justice Paul. No? But since there has been repeated exercise of power since 1957 onwards, under 370, therefore that speaks of the validity too. We have to take that into consideration, if I have understood rightly. It can't be that the power was not there yet, it was being exercised. Now there are two authorities not which I cite here. And one is not the which we could call out, no? because the argument fell from your lordship's no? Your lordship would permit me, but no? what, what, what is the proposition you are seeking? To the make? proposition is that, howsoever long the practice may have been, acquiescence, howsoever long it may have been, that will never confer validity on the provision if the power is not there. No, that, that may, what, what has been put is not in that fashion. What has been said is, if there are two interpretations which are possible. No, no, not that. That's what was put to you. What is being put is the way it has been understood by you. No, as I said, not if two interpretations. Let's now, at this stage, you say, no, no, all that has happened over the last uh, so many decades that's is wrong. Lordship Nobody understood the constitution of JNK. Nobody understood the no, constitution. That's what the Lordships did in the um, Lord Golakna. That's what your Lordships did in Indra Sani. Not in Indra Sani. This will not legitimize a constitution. That will not legitimize. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Dwedi. Thank you very much. We'll now go on to the next. Uh, Mr. Singh. Yes, Mr. Siv Singh now. But there is one decision that we'll also just make a note of it. Yes. 1961, Supreme Court. AIR 1961 Supreme Court 964. Nine Para one and two. 964. What is Nine the name of the case? This is not uh, amalgamated coal fields limited. So para just two paragraphs. No? Okay. One and two. It's a constitution bench. Again, they said these are questions you cannot uh, they, uh, convey no, any kind Thank of you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Devedi. Yes, Mr. Singh. And all that I am saying, Lord, if two views are possible, let's take the view in favor of the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. The autonomy which we had promised, the commitments made. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Yes, Mr. Singh. Thank you, Mr. Devedi. Yes, I am obliged. But I have not, I hope I have not ruffled too many feathers. No, no, not at all. <laughs> It's an intellectual it's exercise. A it's a debate. I mean, it's a debate. Yeah. Therefore, we will give our perspective of what we perceive where the debate may be going, so that you have a chance to, uh, you know, clarify to us. That's all. Otherwise, as I always say, simplest thing is to keep silent. But that's not good for the lawyers. Questions are put to get an answer. It's not the conclusion. Questions are never the conclusion. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Singh. 
Thank you, Mr. 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 Thank you,
So the explanation which said that it's a union, that a union territory, the argument is that we can interchange states and union territories under Article 3 because of the two explanations which were introduced by the 18th Amendment. That was not applicable to Jammu and Kashmir on the 5th of August. So as far as Jammu and Kashmir is concerned on the 5th of August, it was only a state. It could, there any changes under Article 3 could only be state to state. But and this, I'll come to it because I'm just formulating the points. I'll, I'll hand across this. Uh, this. Now, dehorse this aspect. I'm, uh, my submission is that part one, that is articles one, two, three, and four, have to be read conjointly. And when you read them conjointly, no power can be found in article three to convert a state into a union territory, notwithstanding the two explanation, uh, explanations which are added by the 18th Amendment. Four. Yeah. Four or five, because I might lose track because it's all oral. It's four. It was that if two interpretations were possible as far as Article 3 is concerned, then that reading should be preferred, which would be in keeping with the principles of federalism, the principles of democracy, the pr principles of, uh, of the uh, representation of the people of a state, and which would be, which would keep Article 3 out of conflict with Article 368. That reading should be preferred, and not a reading where Article 3 is allowed to ride roughshod coach and horses through Article 368 without any of the safeguards introduced in 368. And this will I'll show your lordships, not just from the constitutional reading, but from the history of the article, Article 3 and Article 364. Um, that is one to four, but three four, and Article three sixty eight, and the the the, the uh, view taken by your lordships in certain judgments, as well as the uh, Dr. Ambedkar's speech on Article three zero four, which was uh, three sixty eight, that there has to be a harmonious construction between these articles, where one, those article that article three and four which allow an amendment to the constitution, but by a simple majority in parliament, can't impinge on, that, on those amendments, which have the effect of um, the, the, uh, either which attract the proviso to 368, or which in any case require a special majority now, by their now, very nature. Think, will you be uh, referring so to I'll the, text, the, history of the this. Text, text to the constitution for uh, developing your argument? How yes. should we now go about it? We you made your four points, you made a note of the four yes. points. No, there is, there, there is a little more here. So, so these are these are the broad uh, broad issues. There might be some some uh, finer points. So let me let me just start straight away with and and I'll, I'm I'm going to try to be brief. But I just want to preface it by saying that well, since I have confined myself to this subject, several of um, uh, Mr. Kapil Sibal, Dr. Davan, etc., all touched on Article Three, but uh, they they made it clear that they're leaving it to me to argue this this. So uh, let's see aspect. Article Three. So I'll them. ask for some latitude from your Lordship Lord on time. Because of this, uh, the, and, and I, I believe that uh, the Reorganization Act, apart from 370, is very, very important for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And also that if this interpretation of Article 3 were to be upheld by your lordships, then this is the thin end of the wedge for democracy and federalism in the country as a whole. Because any, any party in power at the center, if it also happens to be the party in power in a given state, can just convert that state by a simple majority in the state legislature and a simple majority in parliament can convert the state into a union there. It's 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 a very it, this is a this is a proposition of a course okay, of action. Let's see uh, Article Three now. Let's which is which is brought. I'll I'll come back to Article Three in a moment. First notes. I'll I'll go see. Uh, um, yes, yes. The same certainly. Treatment. So first para C two of the presidential proclamation. Where do you get that? In volume three, 
page 92 of the document, volume 3 of the documents. Page 92. This is expressly under challenge in, in at least four of the petitions. And uh, Mr. Ramchandran, Raju Ramchandran's uh, written submission is open with this also. So if we come to C straight away, now therefore I hereby proclaim, I make the following incidental and consequential provisions which appear to me to be necessary or desirable for giving effect to the objects of this proclamation, namely, I'll come straight to two, the operation of the following provisions of the constitution and of the state constitution is hereby suspended, namely, so much of the first proviso to article three of the constitution as relates to the reference by the president to the legislature of the state and the second proviso to that article. And then so much of clause 2 of article 151, etc. But I'm, I'm concerned with this part in particular. So much of the first proviso to article 3 of the constitution as relates to the reference by the president to the legislature of the state and the second proviso to that article. This is now referring to the, the constitution as extended to Jammu and Kashmir because there are two provisos in, the, uh, uh, in, in article 3 which, which were introduced uh, by you know, the, uh, the 1954 presidential order. Uh, just one thing, Mr. C. Singh. The word used over here is suspended. I'm sorry? The word used over here is suspended. Suspended. That's right. It's That's not. It's not. No, no, suspended. Yes. Now, this, we are talking about a presidential proclamation where the constitution has not been work, able to be worked in the, on the report that the president has presumably got from the governor, etc. And therefore, there's a presidential proclamation under 350. No, I, I, I specifically drew your attention to this because you said that if we, in the last, while referring to the fourth argument of yours, the fourth yeah. contention of yours, you use the phrase that in case we, in case this is, uh, there is possibility of misuse. Uh, lost, yes, uh, uh, by suspending and then changing so the nature all, of the oh, state please continue there the suspension it becomes the suspension becomes like a like an obliteration if you suspend a requirement to to consult the people of the state and then change that state into a union territory that suspension is 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 the it, it it's an obliteration virtually it doesn't I'm not the, It might not make any difference uh, whether, Singh, whether we Singh. call it a suspension or a, or a um, um, so, Mr. Singh, are you approaching it from the perspective of Article 356, that the power under Article 356 cannot be used to achieve these ends, such as the suspension? I mean, how are you further exploring the point? Yes, unless, unless this was in furtherance of the object be or authority of the state. Here, the suspension is of a constitutional provision which deals with consultation with the representative body of the state, which is the legislature of the state, the legislative assembly of the state. Now, this can't have any, even the remotest ne nexus with an article uh, with an article 356 object to suspend consultation with the legislature of a state or even i'm now arguing against myself or even the substitute for that legislature which is parliament to suspend that that uh, um, um, uh, consultation altogether can't have any of any nexus with the object of 356 356 is is for the purpose of because the the um, Constitution hasn't been working in that state, or the state isn't able to be governed as per the constitution, and therefore there's a temporary suspension. 
and your side is already i don't want to go into uh, repeat arguments on 357 and your side has been that 356 is for the purpose of restoring democracy not for abrogating that that's is the right. argument that's right and this unless unless the union were to tell your lordship when they uh, start their arguments whenever they do unless the union is to tell your lordship that yes it was an object of article 356 to change jammu and kashmir in form a state to a union territory they can never justify this as having any of any nexus with uh, the object of 356 therefore there are, uh, for a just thing, there are two distinct arguments therefore one whether the power under Article 3 can at all be utilized to convert a state into a union territory. That, that, that one. That, that I'll come to subsequently. And the second, whether this power was correctly utilized or constitutionally exercised at a time when Article 356 was in operation. Does Article 356 yes. empower the union that, to do this? That's right. But I'm. I'm there are two, this two, is different, just, two different uh, areas which we would like to hear from I'm you very briefly. I'm very grateful yes. to, to, to my Lord the Chief Justice. But I'm, this is one step before that. I'm saying that. If you read, it says, make such incidental and consequential provisions as appear to the president to be necessary or desirable for giving effect to the objects of the proclamation, including provisions for suspending in whole or in part the operations of any provisions of this constitution relating to any body or authority of the state. So my argument here is, one, such a, 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 a the para C2 can never even remotely be for giving effect to the objects of the proclamation on 18th of December or 19th of December 2018, the object of the proclamation was not for changing the status of Jammu and Kashmir. And if it were, then it's a fraud on the constitution. It's an absolute fraud on the constitution if you admit that your, or this had a nexus with your object on 18th of December. In fact, to stretch your argument, your argument could be that the object of any proclamation in Article 356 can only be to ensure that the government of the state is carried on in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. As a stepping because stone to restore democ full democracy in that state. But I, I bow to, the, um, to your Lordship's knowledge. I couldn't have put that better very neatly. And I am very happy to... to, to Adopt that line you know, as my own. Now, in this behalf, if your lordship will stay away. Uh, I, I'll uh, rather than take your lordships into Bumai, in my lords, uh, the Honorable Chief Justice's judgment uh, in opinion in Krishna Kumar Singh. If my lords are kind enough just to see that, what 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 is the judicial scrutiny required uh, on lords uh, um, uh, a proclamation, presidential proclamation, lords, volume twenty one of the case law compilation, page at PDF sixty one. A PDF 60, I'm sorry, because your lordships have... Which volume, Mr. C? Uh, volume 21, PDF 60, paras 55 and 56. Your lordships have set out... Uh, this is seven judges, right? Yeah, uh, my lord's judgment was seven judges, and your lordships have just uh, extracted a very uh, uh, appellate um, uh, portion from Boma. Page 60, page 60. Which page? Uh, um, look, PDF 60 in volume 21 of the case law compilation. Do your lordship have it? This one. Look at the foot of that page, Placidum G, just one line above Placidum G, elucidating the approach of the court. When a proclamation under 356 is questioned, Justice Jeevan Reddy held in Bomai case, when, uh, para 373, whenever a proclamation under 356 is questioned, the court will no doubt start with the presumption that it was validly issued. 
but it will not and it should not hesitate to interfere if the invalidity or unconstitutionality of the proclamation is clearly made out. Refusal to interfere in such a case would amount to abdication of the duty cast upon the court, Supreme Court and High Court by the Constitution. The standard of judicial review was formulated in the following observations, Bomai case, para 374, and the truth or correctness of materials cannot be questioned by the court, nor will it go into the ad adequacy of the material. It will also not substitute its opinion for that of the president. Even if some of the material on which the action is taken is found to be irrelevant, the court would still not interfere so long as there is some relevant material sustaining the action. The ground of malafides takes in inter alia situations where the proclamation is found to be a clear case of abuse of power or what is sometimes called fraud on power, cases where this power is invoked for achieving oblique ends. I'm, uh, I'm confining myself to C2. I'm not, uh, 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 others before me have argued on the larger issue, but since I'm on the State Reorganization Act alone, I'm just narrow, keeping it as narrow as possible. C2, I submit, is clearly beyond the purview of, the, uh, of uh, 356. And except for you know, revealing the underlying intention of that proclamation, it does nothing more. C2. Nonetheless, in uh, Rameshwar Prasad, uh, uh, a, a constitutional uh, 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 Chief Justice Sabarwal then speaking for the bench in uh, Rameshwar Prasad at volume 3 uh, PDF 96 if my lords are kind enough to come to that Actually, PDF 95. But, uh, Mr. Singh, is the conversion of the state into a union territory, is it severable from the abrogation of 370 itself? Yes, yes. It is. It is. Uh, the, the two are, are completely separate. Here, what has happened is that are relying on Article 3, uh, they have, uh, uh, by, by, by passing a simple law, parliament, uh, uh, simple parliamentary law under, under Article 3, a state reorganization act was passed. And so your argument on the conversion of uh, JNK into the two UTs, that would uh, really uh, survive irrespective of the decision on yes, the, yes, step, I, the abrogation of the seventy. submission starts with that. That this is completely independent of the abrogation. Whether we, whether JNK was from day one uh, 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 completely under the Constitution of India, with no commas and full stops uh, um, taken out of it, whether it was under 370 as applied to JNK, in with any permutation. Even if you were to exercise this power according to you in relation to any Indian state, that's right. This would be unconstitutional. That's right. Irrespective of the special considerations which apply to JNK in relation to 370. Yes. Yes, and irrespective of the proviso also, the, the scheme of part one and read with article 368, and I'll show you a lot, the, 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 uh, it, it completely precludes such an exercise. Also, I'll, when, I sh when I come to the history, your lordship will find that all right from the 1919 Government of India Act, 1935 Government of India Act, the, the precursors to uh, articles 3, 4 and 368, and then the uh, Constituent Assembly debates and then what came about, this was never the state, the, the powers given to the crown initially uh, to the governor general in 1919, to the crown in 1935 and to the uh, parliament in, uh, in uh, 1950 were powers meant to uh, mediate when a minority perhaps in a state made out a justifiable case for greater self-representation. Suppose there's a linguistic minority in a state, but they have a distinct, distinct, distinct uh, area like Haryana was in Punjab or Himachal uh, was as a, as a, as a, uh, with merger of princely states. The idea or let us say there's, a, there's certain other reasons where there, there are people who can't get a majority in that state assembly to accept, but they, are, they make out a case for greater autonomy, greater representation for full statehood. Parliament under Article 3 and 4 acts as a mediator because... How were the UTs born in, in, yes, in I'll, the Republic? I'll, I'll come to that. I think in my judgment uh, in NCT 2, I've dealt with the whole history of how the UTs have. were created. You, you have. But and it, it were, were the UTs, in, the, in other words, 
was there a peculiar constitutional history attached to the creation of UTs? Yes. And does that category remain frozen now? In fact, in fact, that when, category has moved consistently towards full statehood. By the 4th of August 2019, there was the origin of the creation of UTs. Yes. Then. But look, um, may I? We'll have to then, because that, uh, your argument will have to explore in this way. What is the history surrounding the creation of Union territories under the Indian Constitution? Yes. Two, does that category then remain a sort of fro frozen category in the sense that you can convert a UT into a state, but you can't do the reverse process? That's, That's right. the second point. That's, and that is historically, that is what has happened. So by, by 4th of August 2019, there were seven UTs left in India. And they were Delhi, Chandigarh, um, uh, um, uh, Delhi, Chandigarh, Damanandiu, Dadra, Nagaraveli, Puducherry, Lakshwadeep, and Andaman. All other UTs were gradually, once they became could become viable units, the moment uh, 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 an, uh, an area could become a viable unit as a state, it was converted into a state. But what do we find? I mean, how do how are the UTs created? Yes. So, uh, look, I'll, 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 can I just then give you a lot of the pages for this first argument? Uh, just so that... Uh, yes, certainly. And then yeah, we can move to the next. On, so, in... You are on Rameshwar Prasad until I... Rameshwar Prasad, look, the... Uh, volume 3, page 95, PDF 95, para 96, Here, my Lord, uh, uh, Justice Abarwal spoke uh, for the bench. It was a unanimous verdict of, of the Constitution bench. And what is the principle which Justice Abarwal has laid down there in para on, on the On the nature of the power under 356 and the nature of the scrutiny, he, he goes a step further beyond uh, Lord Bomai. I'll, I'll only uh, uh, take your Lordship very pointedly to the, to the uh, short... Uh, in, uh, three or four important paragraphs. 96, the, uh, uh, Justice Abharwal says, the power under Article 356.1 is an emergency power, but it is not an absolute power. Emergency means a situation which is not normal, a situation which calls for urgent remedial action. Article 356 confers a power to be exercised by the President in exceptional circumstances to discharge the obligation cast upon him by Article 355, which Mr. Nafde pointed uh, to. It is a measure to protect and preserve the Constitution. The governor takes the oath prescribed by 159 to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution and the laws to the best of his ability. The power under 356 is conditional, the condition being the formation of satisfaction of the president as contemplated by 356.1. My submission is that this applies equally to 356.2 and the, when, the, when the president is satisfied that certain uh, measures need to be taken to fulfill the object of the proclamation, that also uh, must meet the same test. Then look at uh, uh, um, uh, para 97. In, uh, there's an extract from Bomai in para 97 of the photo that way. When the proclamation is challenged by making out a prima facie case with regard to its invalidity, the burden would be on the union government to satisfy that there exists material which showed that the government could not be carried on in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. Since such material would be exclusively within the knowledge of the union government in view of the provisions of 106 of the Evidence Act, the burden of proving the existence of such material would, by if and when any action taken by the president in exercise of his functions is questioned in a court of law, it is for the Council of Ministers to justify the same, since the action or order of the President is presumed to have been taken in accordance with Article 74.1. And then 324, para 324, at the foot of that page of Bomai, in our respectful opinion, the above obligation cannot be evaded by seeking refuge under 74.2. The argument that the advice tendered to the pre President comprises material as well, and therefore calling upon the Union of India to disclose the material would amount to compelling the disclosure of the advice, is, if we can say so respectively, uh, respectfully, to indulge in sophistry. The material placed before the President by the Minister or Council of Ministers does not thereby become part of advice. Advice is what is based upon the said material. Material is not advice. And I, I, I won't trouble your lordships. And then para 100 is very important. Uh, 
uh, overleaf at page 97, the above approach shows objectivity even in subjectivity. Constitutionalism or constitutional system of government abhors absolute, absolutism. It is premised on the rule of law in which subjective satisfaction is substituted by objectivity provided by the provisions of the constitution itself. This line is clear also from Maru Ram. And look, then if your Lordship would just come to PDF 120. PDF 120, paras 138 and 140, the very short paras. Uh, PDF page 120 of the same volume, volume 3, Paras 138 and 140. 138. Clearly, Bomai case expanded the scope of judicial review. True, the observations of Justice Reddy were made in the context of a situation where the incumbent chief minister is alleged to have lost the majority support or the confidence of the House, and not in the context of a situation arisen after a general election in respect whereof no opinion was expressed. But in our view, the principles of the scope of judicial review in such matters cannot be any different. And then para 140, thus it is open to the court in exercise of judicial review to examine the question whether the governor's report is based upon relevant material or not, whether it is made bona fide or not, and whether the facts have been duly verified or not. The absence of these factors resulted in the majority declaring the dissolution of the state legislature of Karnataka and Nagaland as invalid. And lastly, my lords, Madhav Rao Sindhya in volume 6, Volume 6, PDF 457. Para 111, I think, had been shown to your lordships by Mr. Nafde, perhaps. But para 113 at page 457 is very important. Volume 6, PDF 457. Para, para 113. 113. By express injunction in Article 53.1 of the Constitution, the executive power vested in the President is directed to be exercised in accordance with the Constitution. That power is, in, is intended to be exercised in aid of and not to destroy constitutional institutions. Granting that power to recognize a ruler carries with it the power to withdraw the recognition of the ruler. The power must be exercised bona fide and in the larger interest of the people, consistently with the provisions of the Constitution to maintain the institution of rulership. Power may therefore be exercised in the course of and for recognizing another person as a successor to the ruler, having regard to the laws and customs governing the state. The president is not competent to recognize a person as a ruler who is not by the custom and law uh, qualified to be a ruler. The president cannot obviously withdraw recognition of a ruler and recognize another, nor can he lawfully depart from laws and customs of the state to introduce a person as a ruler who is not by ties of blood, etc., etc. Now, the next page, you know, the overleaf. 458, the fourth line, but unquestionab unquestionably, the president is not invested with arbitrary authority to recognize a stranger as successor to the Gaddi or not to recognize any person at all as a successor. The power of the president is plainly coupled with a duty, a duty to maintain the constitutional institution, the constitutional provisions, the constitutional scheme, and the sanctity of solemn agreements entered into by the predecessor of the Union government, which are accepted, recognized, and incorporated in the Constitution, and ordered merely de-recognizing a ruler without providing for the continuation of the institution, which is an integral part of the constitutional scheme, is therefore plainly illegal. Look, Madhav Rao was a uh, ju judgment of a bench of 11 learned judges, and Justice J.C. Shah, um, uh, what, uh, his Lordship Justice J.C. Shah was speaking for seven uh, of the, himself and six other learned judges, for seven, the majority of uh, seven. I think there were some concurring and some um, dissenting opinions. But I'm, I'm just placing this that the, uh, this, these powers have to be exercised bona fide. And I don't, I, I, I don't see anything, the, certainly not in their counter, but there's no justification whatsoever for why these two provisos had to be suspended and what nexus that would have with the proclamation under 356. That's, That's the first point. Now, uh, I, may, I, may I just skip over the second point, uh, uh, that timeline? I'll come back to that. I've, I've made a, a just a one-pager where I put, set out that timeline. I can come back to that. Since the question fell from my laws about uh, the, the, the uh, background to union territories and how they, how they came about and so on, and, and what was, what is their status in the constitutional scheme? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, uh, if your lordships are kind enough to see, 
what happened was I'll, I'll just summarize it and I'll take your lordship straight to the relevant uh, uh, um, provisions. 1905, Lord Curzon Malloy split the province of Bengal. This was done unilat unilaterally as a governor general. That led to the, the, the partition or bifurcation of Bengal led to uh, a tremendous backlash against the British Raj. And there were huge protests, all uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of killings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And ultimately, in 1911, Lord Harding was compelled to rescind that move and restore uh, Bengal as one province. Now, this experience led to a declaration by the British Parliament on 20th of August 1917 to devolve greater power on, uh, uh, on, on India and on, particularly on the provinces of India and the representatives of the people in those provinces. And this your Lordship will find the, 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 the declaration by Parliament led to the 1919 Act, the Government of India Act 1919, which specifically provided for the original precursor to Art Article 3. So the 1919 Act, along with that declaration, your Lordship will find, volume 18 of the documents, and it's a, that, that proclamation, that declaration is very important, Lord, than the, uh, as also the preamble to the uh, 1919 Act. Volume 18, page 14, PDF 14, is the declaration of 20th August 1917. Volume 18, page. Volume 18, PDF 14, is the declaration of 1917, 20th August 1917. It's very short. May I read it, please? The policy of His Majesty's government with the government of India and no, Turkey, of course. Everybody? Page 14. I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, volume 18. The Government of India Act 1919, 19. right? Yes. We have section 3 there, 3-1. Yes, but the declaration uh, is at PDF 14. The declaration of 20th August 1917. That's, which, no, that's not at page 14. 14. Page 14 is the Government of India Act. Volume 18 is uh, PDF 14. No, that's 101849, which is the page you are getting. 10835. Oh, uh, 10835. Okay. Yes, I, I don't know why my PDF. Uh, oh, there must have been an earlier version. I'm so sorry. 10835. Would, does anybody have the correct page? 53. What page is it? Uh, I had it at PDF 14 because that was what was given to us. 10835. Uh, the declaration, the 20th of August, uh, declaration of 20th August 1917. It starts with the policy of His Majesty's government, with which the government of India are in complete accord. Well, PDF page 14. Yes, yes, it's there. We all have it as PDF 14. I, th I think that's 10835, right? It's 10835. Uh, 10835. And on this side, we all seem to have it at PDF 14. I, I don't know, there's some mismatch. My Lord, find it now? Yes, I just found it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. This is the no, this is from extracted uh, all this. This entire book is here in this volume, which is the Working Constitution in India by SM Bose. A 1921 publication. Mm. Yes. The policy yeah, of His Majesty's government with which the government. Just one, uh, Mr. One second.
my, my Lord Honorable Justice Surikant finds it much? You know, a problem with PDF 58 also by the section. Perfectly right. matched. Uh, this I, there's some. We could, I, I could hand up an iPad if for my Lord. Uh, your Lordship's Office, 10835, the running page. The declaration of 20th August, the policy of His Majesty's government, with which the government of India are in complete accord, is that the increasing association of Indians in every branch of the administration and the gradual development of self-governing institutions, with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. They have decided that substantial steps in this direct direction should be taken as soon as possible, and that it is of the highest importance as a preliminary to considering what these steps should be, that there should be a free and informal exchange of opinion between those in authority at home and in India. His Majesty's government have accordingly decided with His Majesty's approval that I should accept the Viceroy's invitation to proceed to India to discuss these matters with the Viceroy and the government of India to consider the Viceroy views uh, and the views of local governments and to receive with him the suggestions of representative bodies. I would add that progress in this policy can only be achieved by st successive stages the British government and the government of India on whom the responsibility lies for the welfare and advancement of the Indian peoples must be judges of the time and measure of each advance and they must be guided by the cooperation received from those upon whom uh, no Mr. Singh, what is the relevance of this actually? Then, uh, your Lord, should just see the preamble. I'm sorry. The, the, pro the progress, uh, when your Lord should see the, the, the particular section, the, the preamble then was based on this of the act in 1919 was five pages down. Mm. If your Lordship just scrolls down five pages to the government of India. Mm. Now the preamble to the act specifically said the 1919 act, whereas it is a declared policy of parliament to provide for the increasing association. So, based on this same declaration, the, the, there was the were the UTs the, the the all condition. come back? Were the UTs all a part of the Part C territories? So, I'm just coming to that provision then straight away. If your lordships, uh, I have it at uh, PDF page fifty-eight. And before the, the constitution came into force, where were these Part C territories comprised? Yeah, so so there were they were the chief commissioners' province. Yes, yes, that's right. So there was there were the uh, the uh, governors' provinces became Part A states. The governor general and then later the governor. So Bombay province, Madras province, Calcutta, uh, 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 Fort William, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. became the Part A states. The Indian states, which became Part B, not all of them, there were 562 states, those which could be merged and made into viable states, because viability was the main crux here. But JNK was also a Part B state. That's right. So those which were viable as states, 
all Indian states which were viable either by either standing as they stood or by merger became part B states. Those which were now, the Government of India you, Act. What was the classification of the territories in the Government of India Act? Yeah, that uh, in in the Government of India Act, uh, it uh, no, there were uh, governors' provinces, there were uh, chief commissioners' provinces, and I'll I'll just uh, I'll just show that. So we must look at what was the position in the Government of India Act. That's right. How that transformed into the Constitution. Yes. So that will give us an idea of how the Union territories were created. Yes. Uh, and in fact, in the, the Union territories came into being. One thing is very clear: the Union territories came into being with the Seventh Amendment in 1956. So, in the Seventh that Amendment, that abrogated the distinction between Part A, Part B, and Part C states and the Part D territories. Yes. And then brought the entirety of India into the states and the Union territories. Union territories. Now, so uh, I'll just show you also the progression. So, if your lordship sees here, the uh, uh, please come straight away to you know, PDF 58, which would be. Uh, in, in the same volume, it's 10879 running page. Page 58. Uh, but your, your 58 won't match because 14 wasn't matching. Uh, could your Lordship tell me what was your equivalent PDF for 14? Uh, the difference is 14 pages actually. 14 pages. For, uh, 14 more. So oh. this 58 would be 72. Perhaps around 72. 10879. Page 50. 10879. It should be a PDF 72 if there's a difference of 14 pages. What? How does it start? Uh, uh, section 14 is on the top. Government of India uh, 10879 is the running page. The printed page number is 44 and it's PDF. We have PDF 58, all of us here. PDF 72 is 10907. 10907? PDF 44. Oh, it's 14 less than. So it should be 44, perhaps PDF 44. PDF 44 should, should work uh, 43 you're, of You're referring to internal page 44. PDF is 58. Section 14 you're referring Section to. Yes, 14, yes. Right? we are getting PDF 58. That is 10879. Yes. That is page 44, I think. No, that's page yeah. 44. Yeah. PDF yeah. is uh, page so your lordship's PDF is matching the internal page number, I think. So now 15-1. Which page? On, uh, I, I actually, I'm, what, what, I, what I'm taking your lordships to are the is the precursors to Article Three. But to answer the Union Territory aspect, in my written submission, your lordship will find that. So now we are at one zero eight seven nine with a great effort. So let's focus on that. We don't, uh, so we this, don't lose this precious page. Yeah. So this is the precursor to Article Three in the nineteen ninety nine uh, uh, section fifteen. Section 15. Yes. All right. Let's Constitu see that. And the marginal notice, constitution of new provinces, etc., and the provisions as to backward track. The governor general and council may. Now, please note after obtaining an expression of opinion from the local government and the local legislature affected. This is why I was reading that preamble and the declaration of the, uh, of, of the king, His Majesty. The Governor General may, after obtaining an expression of opinion from the local government and the local legislature affected by notification with the sanction of His, His Majesty previously signified by the Secretary of State and Council, constitute a new Governor's province or place part of a Governor's province under the administration of a Deputy Governor to be appointed by the Governor General and may in any such case apply with such modifications as appear necessary or desirable, all or any of the provisions of the Principal Act or this Act relating to Governor's provinces or provinces under a lieutenant governor or chief commissioner to any such new province or part of a province. Therefore, that is the power to constitute a new governor's province. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. And then sub subsection 2 deals with the backward tracks. We are not concerned with that. This was 
then carried forward in section 290 of the 1935 act where is that that your lordship will find look uh, i'm sorry in this uh, could your lordship just read the footnote to this section 15 there's a footnote of the committee the committee report which is very important this is on on in the the whole thing of self governance the footnote is on the next page for constituting the committee have two observations to make on the working of this clause on the one hand they do not think that any change in the boundaries of a province should be made without due consideration of the views of the legislative council of the province on the other hand they are of opinion that any clear request made by a majority of the members of a legislative council representing a distinctive racial or linguistic territorial unit for its constitution under this clause as a sub province or a separate province should be taken as a prima facie case on the strength of which a commission of inquiry might be appointed by the secretary of state and that it should not be a bar to the appointment of such a commission of inquiry that the majority of the legislative council of the province in question is opposed to the request of the minority representing representing such a distinctive territorial now, where is this the... is that this is that what i was saying about the arbiter parliament being an arbiter when there is within a now, state where is the government of india act section 290 uh, 290 your lordship will find in volume 6 millers of the document PDF 113, and I trust you know, this time we'll all be on the same page. Volume 6. Volume 6. Page. Page 113, Milad. 290 is almost in the same form in which Article 3 came to be um, uh, enacted by, by the Constituent Assembly. What is it, page Your Lordship have page 113, Milad. PDF 113. One, one, three. one, three. Volume six, no, document volume six. Two ninety. Creation of new provinces and alteration of boundaries of provinces. Uh, which is the uh, and how are the provinces distributed under the Government of India Act actually? Uh, uh, section 5 you know, of this. Uh, yeah. I uh, refer to what is the PDF page for page? Uh, uh, PDF page 18. My, I'm very grateful to Mr. Shankar Narayan. 1 8. Yes. Uh, uh, Proclamation of the Federation of India. PDF 18 of this same volume 6 notes. Establishment of Federation and Accession of Indian States, Proclamation of Federation, it shall be lawful for His Majesty, Mary, that if an address in that behalf has been presented to him by each House of Parliament, and if the condition hereinafter mentioned is satisfied, to declare by proclamation that as for the day herein, appoint, therein appointed, there shall be united in a federation under the crown. No, uh, but it's kind of important because it says it shall comprise of the provinces, here enough to call the governor's provinces, and the Indian states which have acceded or may thereafter accede to the federation. And, 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 and in the federation, federation so established, there shall be included the provinces here enough to call the chief commissioner's provinces. That's right. Then the conditions referred to is that states, the rulers, where, uh, whereof will, in, in accordance with the provision contained in part two of the first schedule, be entitled to choose not less than 52 members of Council of State, and the aggregate population whereof, as a certain in accordance with the set pro provisions, amounts to at least one half of the total population of the state, so a certain, have acceded to the federation. Then the manner of accession is in section six. <laughs> And the footnote notes to section 5, it says section 5 was substituted as follows. This is, this is not the, um, after 15th August 1947, I think this was in 1948, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, this is important. Government of India says, was, so with the Indian Independence Act, we got the governor's provinces the chief commissioner's provinces, 
the Indian states in the manner here and after provided and any other areas that may be with the consent of the dominion included in that dominion. Yes. And this was this was not on this was not under the Indian Independence Act. This was an amendment to the Government of India Act 1935. Right. Following the Indian Independence Act. Oh, following the Indian Independence Act, absolutely. Because till then it was only the British Parliament which would, which could enact the law. After 15 uh, August 1947, the uh, uh, amendments were made by the um, uh, in the Dominion uh, by the Dominion. Now, were the Chief Commissioners provinces uh, is to refer to in any schedule to the Government of India Act or no? Uh, Chief Commissioners provinces no. I I think it's in the 1919 Act, but. Just check in the 1990. Just check it. Page? Page 49. Oh, of this very thing? Oh, I'm very grateful. Part 4, the Chief Commissioner of the Province, correct. At PDF 49, my lord, have that? Section 94 onwards. Uh, my Lord will find this, uh, my Lord, uh, Honorable Justice Surya Khan will find it, yes. PDF 49. Madam. Yes, sir. Good. Part 4, the Chief Commissioner's Provinces. Uh, the following shall be the Chief Commissioner's Provinces, that is to say, the heretofore existing Chief Commissioner's Provinces of British Baluchistan, Delhi, Ajmer, Merwar, Purk, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, the area known as Panth Piploda, and such other Chief Commissioner's Provinces as may be created under this Act. Aden shall cease to be a part of India. A chief commissioner's province shall be administered by the governor general, acting to each ex to such extent as he think thinks fit through a chief commissioner to be appointed by him in his discretion. Then British Baluchistan is set out in so ninety five. Now, now from here we go to the constitution. Would it be correct to say that when the constitution is adopted on twenty sixth of January nineteen fifty, the territories were comprised into part A states? which comprised of the governor's provinces, the erstwhile governor's yeah. provinces. Part B states, which were the Indian states which had acceded to the dominion of India. Part C no, states... No, only such of those which were viable. Right, we are not now on the Jammu and Kashmir thing at all. We are now looking at the broad... Yes. Uh, yes. So this, in, this in, argument in, is, is independent of the JNK issue. Yes. Part C states were the erstwhile chief commissioner's provinces. Yes. And, and part D states were the other territories. No, and part C let's states also the, had one more category. Let's look at the constitution as of 26th of January 1950. Because that schedule will give us the distribution between what was part A, what is part B, part C yes. and part D. Uh, just one qualification. That, that was the part C states had the Raj Pramukh. That's right. I think part B also had the Raj Pramukh. Part, part C had the Raj Pramukh. Part A had the governors. That's right. And that continued from 1950 to 1956. That's right. 56 following the Fazal Ali Commission, everything is abrogated and you just have states and union territories. That's right. But just one small qualification, Part C states also included Indian states which were not able to be uh, uh, merged into a, into a viable unit. So, for instance, Himachal Pradesh was uh, 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 consisting of 30 Indian states. 30 small Indian states, but because the province of Punjab, the, the governor state of Punjab came almost to the edge of Shimla at that time, the, a lot of the, there were hill areas of Punjab and they were, they automatically went as a part, uh, a part A state. So, uh, Himachal Pradesh with its 30 states, uh, acceding, uh, and, and merging into it still was not viable. So it was a part C state. Though it was Indian states, but part C. So there were several such cases of those which were not viable as independent state for independent statehood at that point in time. It became a part C state. It became a union territory in 1956. Then the uh, in 1966, when Punjab demanded a Punjabi Suba, and there was a huge movement and uh, agitation, etc., as a negotiation to give Punjab a linguistic state, Haryana was carved out. And the hill areas of Punjab were carved out and given to Himachal. 
it still continued temporarily as a ut and in 1971 it was made into a full state now do we have the constitution just to complete the whole exercise yeah, yeah. the constitution as of 26 january 1950 where is that yeah yeah they can put on the screen all right they'll put it on the screen actually if if your lordship is in the meantime may i just very quickly take your lordship to my written submission a very brief thing on how this transition took place page 468 of my written submission so mr c u singh at the time when punjab the division of punjab took place there were two union territories uh, himachal pradesh was carved out as a union and chandigarh and chandigarh was carved because out. the common because of the correct there were two union territories that's right. which were carved out. that's right that's right absolutely your lordship are right i in fact this is all in my note but uh, uh, and uh, it, it, even in the written uh, submission but the the uh, point here is right from the 1919 act the progression has been consistently and and continuously towards greater self governance and greater self governance in the form of full statehood so we are only in the today for that the question is legality of that order in terms of article 3 that's right that's right so but but the the uh, context in which we the the reading that i would ad, uh, 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 seek to persuade your lordships to adopt is one which would be consistent with that objective of greater self governance when we read article 3 as opposed to article 368 that greater self governance and uh, and the move that because keep in mind that barring these small unviable or special status uh, uh, union territories like delhi chandigarh Uh, Andaman and Nicobar, Dadra and Nagar Haveli, etc. By 4th of August 2019, there were only seven union territories left in India, and the seven were Delhi, Chandigarh, Andaman and Nicobar, uh, Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, and uh, Puducherry. Puducherry and Puducherry. These were the seven union territories left. All others were merged or or uh, uh, amalgamated. Now see, now see what they have put up on. It's very interesting. Part A. This is on the date of the constitution. Part A states are basically nine states: Assam, Bihar, Bombay, Madhya Pradesh, Madras, Orissa, Punjab, United Provinces, and West Bengal. That's right. Now let's see Part B. थोड़ा सा scroll कर लीजिए. Part B. We get this. ये कहाँ से मिला आपको? Part अच्छा हम गोपाल के Part B states में जो ना Part B आ हैदराबाद, जम्मू एंड कश्मीर, मध्य भारत, माइसो, पटियाला एंड द ईस्ट पंजाब स्टेट दैट द पेप्सू पटियाला एंड ईस्ट पंजाब स्टेट यूनियन, राजस्थान, सौराष्ट्र, ट्रावनको कोचिन एंड विंध्य प्रदेश। Right. Then you also you also see The territories of the state, the territory of each of the states in this part shall comprise the territory which immediately Press before the adoption of the constitution was in the corresponding Indian state, and in the case of each of the states of Rajasthan and Sarasa, shall also comprise. Jammu and Kashmir ka territory, see, 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 see. Little bit above, and go up. Little bit lower. No, no, above, above. Now, now your lordships will see that some of those commissioners provinces were merged into Part B states because they they became viable. Fifoda, हाँ वही वही पर अजमेर, भोपाल, बिलासपुर, पूर्वीहार, पूर्व दिल्ली, हिमाचल प्रदेश, कच्छ, मणिपुर एंड त्रिपुरा। हिमाचल प्रदेश was at that time also Part, part C में था। Was it not included in Punjab? Yeah, yeah. It was later on included in Punjab that time. And ऊपर जाइए थोड़ा सा। Now the second explanation there will describes where they came from. The beneath each of the list, you know, the territories are are given, and that shows how different uh, units were merged into them, even at on the beginning of the constitution. Right. I have also got a table in my uh, in and part D only comprised of Andaman and Nicobar. Andaman and Nicobar, which was uh, which was a, a, a 
chief commissioner's province in the 1935 uh, uh, in the uh, 1935 act but that was carved out separately so Ladakh is a UT and the change of status from a state to a UT of Jammu and Kashmir. Yes, sir. Both aspects. Both. Uh, 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 first of all, just the conversion of a state into a union territory, I submit, is only, if at all it could be done. I, I submit it, it violates the basic structures. It can't even be done under Article 368. But if at all it could be done, it could be done only by under Article 368 because it clearly impinges on at least six or seven provisions in the proviso. So it would require both the special majority and ratification by more than the legislatures of more than 50% of the states to convert a state into union territory. And I'll make good that submission. Therefore, I refer to two different things. Carving the change of status is one. And suppose Jammu and Kashmir assembly status was maintained and only UT was carved out. Then what would be argued? Even, even so much. Uh, the, the, the submission really is that uh, for both for Ladakh and for Jammu and Kashmir rulers, the exercise which has been done is one which is uh, clearly beyond the purview of Article 3. It was not permissible under Article 3 at all, even if it had been rightly done. I, I'll show from the timeline that it's actually not even done as per Article 3. But assuming it were rightly done under Article 3, this is not the scope of the power of Article 3. When, when, I, when I take your lordships through the provisions of the Constitution, your lordship will see Article 295, Article 294, etc. A state comes with property or lands, property, consolidated fund, rights, contracts, right to raise money. It has, it has, uh, it has absolutely sacrosanct powers under, under Article 73, read with Article 162, the executive power, the legislative powers. You your one hour. How long would you now take? Look, I, I'll uh, try to be as brief as possible. I think it will take about an hour or so. No, no, no. I'll, one hour, no, Mr. Look, I, can't be. One look, hour I'll, can't be. I'll, I'll tell you, also, this is uh, what I'm arguing is something no, nobody else has argued. But the main thing here is we are saying what is the point that regardless, the regardless of what is the point of this chart, then? Look, independent. You, will, you're supposed to have a kind of an arguing comes you know, discussion. Look, in one hour, uh, you take two hours, then this schedule means nothing. Look, I, I acceded to your lordship wishes and I confined myself from day one. I adopted other people's arguments. I'm not going, touching on 370 at all. I'm saying that I'm, I'm and, and if I, if at any stage your lordship feel that I'm going beyond the, the, um, the, the purview of the, uh, the, there are certain, the four or five points which I but outlined at the beginning. You've made I your four points, good. but you have made your four points now and your argument really is this. Yes. The, these powers were always exercised after due democratic consultation with the people of the concerned region, state, or territory. And this, your lordship will find in my written submissions. My written submissions were um, that PDF 445. Of the I won't say with the people of the territory, we'll say with the legislative representatives. Of pe the people of the territory through their rep representatives, which which is why I showed your lordships the section 15, which is why I showed your lordships the footnote to section 15, the committee report which led to section 15 of the 1990 Act, 1919 Act. Lordships recall that uh, the committee report and what they said about the consultation. Similarly, the 1935 Act, and then lords. And in my written submission, which is that, uh, uh, no, uh, these points are made out. I'm I'm just summarizing it. At page four four five of the combined written submissions is my written submission PDF four four five. From pages four sixty four to four seventy two, I deal with this history and progression of union territories. Four sixty four to four seventy two. I'm not even taking your lodges through it. I'm just identifying it for your lot. In particularly, Milot's paras 41 to 43, that a note may be made of this. I've set out a chart of how various territories changed from Part C state 
to uh, union territory, part C state to union territory to st full statehood, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I was, uh, uh, um, uh, the way I would sum it up is that, that uh, when your lordships see schedule one to the constitution and the section on union territories, my lords will find that today there are only six. I mean, uh, 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 take, take away Jammu and Kashmir, because even Dadra and Nagar Haveli and Daman and Diu have been merged into one in 2020. They've been merged into, uh, they've been made into one unit. Even though they're four, they're, because they're four small parts, 800 kilometers this side, 400 kilometers that side, et cetera, et cetera. Because between Daman and Diu, it's an 800 kilometer driving distance. I mean, not flying, but if you drive around the, uh, and uh, to, down the run of Kutch, et cetera. So, uh, uh, so these small non-viable territories have remained, which are not viable as states have remained as union territories. None, none other, all have gone in one direction. So this your Lordship will find in my note. I'll say no more about this. That's done. Now coming to the next point, Lords, is that three and four have to be read. First of all, I said that three and four have to be read as part of part one. Now part one is very important because your Lordships have been showed article one and two. Article one says India shall be a union of states. Article 1 was amended by the 7th uh, Amendment when Union Territories came to be introduced. But Article 1, 1 and 1, 2 were not amended. Union Territories were added in 1, 3. Uh, sorry, in 1, 3, B. So even while amending in the 7th Amendment, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. The territory, uh, the states and the territories thereof shall be as specified in the first schedule. These were not amended when this, when union territories came into being in the seventh uh, amendment. What is added is three: the territory of India shall comprise a the territories of the states, b the union territories specified in the first schedule, and c such other territories. But the basic concept of India that is Bharat shall be a union of states was maintained. Article 2 was maintained as it is. Admission or establishment of new states. Parliament may by law admit into the union or establish new states on such terms and conditions as it thinks fit. Article 3 was not amended till the 18th amendment when those two explanations were inserted now the explanation has become the tail which is wagging the dog and from that it is sought to be contended by the union that because the explanation says for certain po portions the state shall include union territory therefore any permutation and combination is now available to parliament under article 3 now
keeping aside the fact that the two explanations were not never extended to Jammu and Kashmir. The two explanations which were introduced by the 18th Amendment were never applied to Jammu and Kashmir. Yes, sir. I'll come yes, back to that, keeping that aside for the moment. So this, this fiction that you can convert a state into a union territory was by the constitution of India never applied to Jammu and Kashmir. But keeping that aside for a moment, because I'll come to that on that timeline issue. Now, please see the enormity of, of it if you accept this argument for a moment of converting states into union territories as a whole, and for the whole of the country, including Jammu and Kashmir, because we are, we are saying that it's an integral part of India. Please see Article 294 and 295 may just be seen. I, uh, these particular articles I want to show because my Lord, the Honorable Chief Justice, wanted to know how do these uh, how were these provinces dealt with by the constitution of India? So under 294, those properties of the His Majesty's government, which were used for the dominion, be became part of the union properties. Please see 294A, all property and assets which immediately before such commencement were vested in His Majesty for the purposes of the government of the Dominion of India and all property and assets which immediately before such commencement were vested in His Majesty for the purposes of the government of each governor's province shall vest respectively in the union and the corresponding state. So <coughs> properties which were for the Dominion vested in the union of India, properties which were for a governor's state which were being used for a governor's state vested in the corresponding state, Punjab, uh, uh, Bombay state, Madras state, etc., etc. The properties pertaining to that state vested in the state by constitution. Similarly, all rights and liabilities, etc., again, respectively, in, in B. Then 295, succession to properties, assets, and in other cases. Now, please see 2. Sub 2, I'm just taking a look. This is now dealing with the Indian state. Subject to the force of the government of each state specified in part B of the first schedule shall as from the commencement of this constitution be the successor of the government of the corresponding Indian state as regards all property and assets and all rights and liabilities and obligations that are arising out of any contract or otherwise other than those referred to in clause one. Yes. So these those properties became the part B state's properties. Part C and part D were not defined here because they were the union had control of them. The union had control of part C and part D so they remained in a sort of a silo because uh, what really happened is Part C and Part D and Union territories are really a stepping stone. It's a silo kept as sort of a, a holding pen, so to speak. Till you can get full statehood, the holding pen, the silo in which you're kept, you're kept safe and secure under the benign uh, <laughs> the umbrella of the Union of India. It's really for that. It was never intended. And Mr. Singh, anyway, Mr. Nafude, now, now, Mr. Now, Nafude, I'll, I'll just second. make put this point. Mr. Nafude, in the concluding part of his submissions, has given us a whole list of what the impact on the constitutional structure is. And we have made note of that. One, he said Ladakh has no representation in the Rajya Sabha. Two, Rajya Sabha, all of the four seats go to JNK. Three, La Lok Sabha, Article 81C, all UTs, UTs can have a maximum of 20 seats. Article 81 2, other states' seats depend on population. JNK has no proportional representation in the Lok Sabha. Presidential election, Article 54 and 55. Yes. JNK, no MLA for presidential election. The reorganization of Act of 2019 gives the same rights as Puducherry. 279A, no representation of the GST Council and High Court judges, no views right. of the CMRT. I'll just add a few more. I'll, uh, now, I, I won't take your lordship to the section. I wanted to show this section just to show how property devolved, property and rights devolved. Now, I'll just mention a few more. Under Article 266, provides for the consolidated fund of the union and a separate consolidated fund of the states, so, uh, 261 and 2. 283 2 provides for the custody of the consolidated fund of the state and the manner of withdrawal from that custody. 289 exempts the property and, and income of a state from union taxation. Once, um, uh, uh, 283, um, um, uh, uh, 162, now this is very important, 162 says, subject to the provisions of this constitution, the executive powers of the state shall vest in the state in respect of list 2 and list 3. List 3 only if parliament makes a specific provision by a law 
to exercise executive powers in respect of some particular provision of list three executive powers now i'm talking about only then to that extent the state will yield executive powers to the to the union otherwise all executive powers in the state of on on subjects of list two and and uh, list three are exercised by the state and this is not subject to a law made by parliament this is subject to the provisions of this constitution the reason it is subject is that 256 257 are a qualifier on 162 256 257 is where the union for purposes of defense etc etc can encroach to some extent on the on the powers of the state 73 is the concomitant executive powers of the union 73 has a please just see that 73 has a specific provision which says the union shall not exercise any of the powers of the state 73 subject to the provision of this constitution again not by law the executive power of the union shall extend to matters with respect to which parliament has the power to make laws and to the exercise of such rights authority and jurisdiction proviso, the proviso now proviso provided that the executive power referred to in sub clause a shall not save as expressly provided in this constitution or in any law made by parliament extend in any state to matters with respect to which the legislature of the state has also powers to make law the proviso to 73 and the proviso to 162 are mirror images mirror images mirror images because so, the executive power of the state also extends to laws to to concurrent field subjects that's right and including any law made by parliament in the concurrent list unless parliament expressly reserves the power to the union government that's right that's right absolutely right then was 293 further clarifies that the executive of power of the state extends to domestic borrowings against the consolidated fund of the state so so there's a specific constitutional power of that 298 extends the executive power of the state to carrying on trade or business acquiring properties etc all right mr singh we've and then 246 and the lists yes now now by a simple expedient of a simple ordinary majority under article 3 all these constitutional rights all these constitutional rights many of which are directly uh, part of the basic structure of the constitution are wiped out so look the 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 theory is point is taken mr singh we want no, uh, this has been dealt with by your lordship fortunately and i want to just place that uh following you know, the, uh, if your lordships are kind of just to see the judgment of the of, of a constitution bench in in uh, shankari that one called this so uh, if my lords are kind enough to take up uh shankari prasad i I'd, I'd ask the um learned court master to keep it ready it's on the screen but the, this is AR 1951 sc 458 and his lordship justice patanjali shastri speaking for the bench Talked of, spoke of harmonious interpretation of the different modes of amendment under the constitution. Para. The Lord come to para six. Para six. On the first point, it was submitted. And then overleaf, let's come to the last about eight lines of para six. Various methods of constitutional amendment. Do your lordship find that? Various methods of constitutional amendment have been adopted in written constitutions, such as by referendum, by a special convention, by legislation under a special pr procedure, and so on. But which of these methods the framers of the Indian Constitution have adopted must be ascertained from the relevant provisions of the Constitution itself, without any leaning based on a priori gr grounds or the analogy of other constitutions in favor of one method in preference to another. We accordingly turn to the provisions dealing with constitutional amendments. Now the constitution provides for three classes of amendments of its provision. First, those that can be affected by a bare majority, such as that required for the passing of any ordinary law. The amendments contemplated in articles 4, 169 and 240 fall within this class and they are specifically excluded from the purview of article 368. Secondly, those that can be affected by a special majority as laid down in article 368. All constitutional amendments other than those referred to above come within this category and must be affected by schedule. This class comprises amendments that seek to make any change in the provision referred to in the proviso to Article 368. This is what uh, my learned friend Mr. Nafde highlighted some of those provisions which directly uh, uh, fall within A to E of uh, the proviso. 
it will be seen that the power of effecting the first class of amendments is explicitly conferred on parliament that is to say the two houses of parliament and the president this would lead one to suppose in the absence of a clear indication to the contrary that the power of effecting the other two classes of amendments has also been conferred on the same body parliament for the requirement of a different majority which is merely procedural can itself be no reason of entrusting the power to a different body and examine it because the argument here was being made that a, a constitutional amendment can't be made by parliament it has to go back to a constituent assembly so that was a, 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 a negative now Milo, this was followed in sajjan singh this uh, shankari dealt with the first amendment and sajjan singh dealt with the 17th amendment was that is ar 1965 sc 845 And para 7, 8, uh, please just see the first four lines of para 7, Lodin Sajjan Singh. In our opinion, my Lord Dhabda, in our opinion, the two parts of Article 368 must on a reasonable construction be harmonized with each other in the sense that the scope and effect of either of them should not be allowed to be unduly reduced or enlarged. Then in para 8, words, about line 7 from the top, in other words, in construing both the parts of Article 368, the rule of harmonious construction requires that if the direct effect of the amendment rights on the powers of the High Courts prescribed by 226 is indirect, incidental, or is otherwise of an insignificant order, it may be that the proviso will not apply. In other words, you have to harmonize these two provisions, and if it is substantially falling within uh, impinging on those A to E of the proviso, then you have to follow the, the uh, uh, greater then come to para 30 minutes of this. So we'll see that, Mr. Singh. This is well settled. We'll, we'll have a look at it. Uh, very well. I only want to point out para 30 minutes because uh, para 30 deals with Article 4 directly. So I, I would request your lordship, para 30. Incidentally, we may also refer to the fact that the constitution makers have taken the precaution to indicate that some amendments should not be treated as amendments of the constitution for the purpose of Article 368. Take, for instance, Article 4.2, which deals with law made by virtue of Article 4.1. Article 4.2 provides that no such law shall be deemed to be an amendment of the Constitution for the purposes of Article 368. Similarly, Article 169.3 provides that any law in respect of the amendment of the existing legislative apparatus by the abolition or creation of legislative councils in states shall not be deemed to be an amendment of the Constitution for the purposes of 368. In other words, laws falling within the purview of Articles 4.2 and 169.3 need not be passed subject to the restrictions imposed by Article 368, even though in effect they may amount to the amendment of the relevant provisions of the Constitution. So the, they say that the, 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 these provisions have to be read harmoniously, as in not the Shankari, and uh, the, they, are except, they are exempted. But the exemption can't mean that you completely efface the, the uh, if you are falling within 368, to efface you know, the, 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 the provisions there. Now, as it happens, you know, this is, uh, if you're watching, just go uh, very quickly you know, to the Constituent Assembly debates for a moment. I just want to show you a lot of Dr. Ambedkar on this, his speech on this very same uh, provision and why this descend, this ascending power of uh, uh, amendment and how it has to, each one has to apply only in their limited sphere. So if you're watching, see volume eight of the documents. And at page 881, this is Dr. Ambedkar's speech uh, begins at uh, the previous page 880, dealing with uh, uh, Article 304, the draft Article 304, which is 368. Now, para 4, on page 881, now let me turn to the provision of our constitution. What is it that we propose to do with regard to the amendment of our constitution? We propose to divide the various articles of the constitution into three categories. In one category, we have placed certain articles which would be open to amendment by parliament by a simple majority. That fact, unfortunately, has not been noticed by reason of the fact that mention of this matter has not been made in article 304, but in different other articles of the constitution. Let me refer to some of them. Take, for instance, Articles 2 and 3, which deal with the states. So far as the creation of new states is concerned or the reconstitution of existing states is concerned, this is a matter which can be done by parliament by a simple majority. 
Similarly, take for example Article 148A, which deals with the upper chambers in the provinces. Parliament has been given perfect freedom to either abolish the upper chambers or to create new second chambers in provinces which do not now have them by a simple majority. Now take Article 213, which deals with the states in Part 2. With regard to the constitution of the states, the draft constitution also leaves the making of the constitution of states in Part 2 and their modification of Parliament. Nothing much itself. turns on this, really. No, the the, uh, uh, no, the the harmonious reading, if your lordship. Uh, so, uh, that I, read, that's well settled. Why do we have to read the, the speech for that? Uh, I'm sorry, Mulut. We don't have to read the speech to have harmonious construction. No, I, uh, I'm only on this. Uh, what what uh, Justice Patanjali Shastri, the formulation that he made in Shankari. The actually, three, the three provisions bare majority. Two thirds majority and two thirds majority with ratification. Those are the three separate uh, provisions. Just CP eighty two for a moment. Just flag it. Your lordship, just flag it. The third para in eighty two. Now, what is it we do? And the next para below that, after the interjection by the president. Yes, now we have no doubt put certain articles in a third category. Where for the purposes of amendment, the mechanism is somewhat different or double. It requires two thirds majority plus, two -thirds ratification. plus ratification. I shall explain why we think that in case of certain articles, it is desirable to adopt this procedure. If members of the House who are interested in this matter are to examine the articles that have been put under the proviso, they will find that they refer not merely to the center, but to the relations between the center and the provinces. We cannot forget the fact that while we have in a large number of cases invaded provincial autonomy, we still intend and have as a matter of fact seen to it that the federal structure of the constitution remains fundamentally unaltered. We have by our laws given certain rights to provinces and resolved certain rights to the center. We have distributed legislative authority, we have distributed executive authority, and we have distributed administrative authority. Obviously, to say that even those articles of the That's constitution which pertain to the administrative legislative and other powers. Two to 883. It's very important because it specifically deals with 73 and 162, the, the uh, article you know, the, which was 60 and 142. And it says that these cannot be changed. These, this ratio, this uh, balance cannot be changed except by a special majority coupled with ratification by more than half the states. So uh, that, that, that may be uh, just noted. Now in Mangal Singh, this is reiterated and I'll just give your lordship the pages now. Mangal Singh, your lordship will find at volume 6, PDF 386, para 6. Yes. And in state of Himachal Pradesh versus Union of India, volume 14, PDF 776, Volume number 14. Volume 14, PDF 776, para 93. And this is very important, Mulaj, if I can just draw your lordship's attention to it. Specifically, the Supreme Court held Mulaj in this judgment. What is not permissible under uh, Mulaj's um, um, Article 3 and 4, if your lordship are kind enough just to turn to volume 14, uh, page 776. Para 93, we find, my Lord Thakar, volume 14, page 776, para 93, we find that under the provisions of Article 3 of the Constitution, par Parliament has the power to form a new state by separation of territory from any state, or by uniting two or more states, or parts of states, or by uniting any territory to a part of any state, Increase the area of any state, diminish the area of any state, alter the boundaries of any state, and alter the name of any state. But under Article 3, Parliament cannot take away the powers of the state executive or the state legislature in respect of matters enumerated in List 2 of the 7th Schedule to the Constitution. 
This has been made clear in the speech of Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly quoted in paragraph 52 of the decision of this court in Kuldeep Nayar versus Union of India. Relevant portion from the speech is quoted, the basic principle of federalism is that legislative and executive authority is partitioned between the center and the states, not by any law to be made by the center, but by the constitution itself. This is what the constitution does. The states under our constitution are in no way dependent upon the center for their legislative or executive authority. The center and the states are co-equal in this matter. And then, my lords, your lordships have been shown Berubari in volume 13, page 492. Various paras, but my lord, may just note the paras in Berubari, volume 13. It starts at page 492, Paris 36, 38, 44, and especially 46 are very important. Then Millard's uh, RC Podial, etc. Your lordships have been have been shown those. I won't. Uh... So yes, yes, reeling of judgments. I, I'm uh, so sorry. Yes, reeling of the judgments and giving para numbers. It doesn't it form a part of your synopsis? If it parts, forms a part of your synopsis, we will give a consideration to it. Well, otherwise, what's happening is you're depriving your other colleagues of a right to. You know, I, you know, I, uh, uh, because, because of the in the context of that, this could only have been done under 362. That is my that is uh, 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 the essence. Now, the last point, Blood, then I and, and and I will close is what I uh, the second point I had raised, but uh, my lord, the honorable chief justice wanted me to address on union territories to start with. So, this is with regard to the the, uh, the timeline and how there was no power at all to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to table or enact this this law at all uh, 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 in the manner in which it has been done, the the reorganisation. Please just take this timeline. Thank you. Parliament, how Parliament passes it? Does it fall within? No. Uh, if, if there was the point here is not the point here is if it if it is uh, uh, if CO two two seven three was not there. And the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir and the constitution of India as applicable in Jammu and Kashmir was in force. This could not have been tabled at all. I'm trying to say there was not inadequate debate, how the parliament was conducted. This would be a difficult area to get. We understood the other proposition. But now to say no, when they did it in this much time. No, if, if they have done it not this much time, but this much time. No, no, no. Let, let me put let, I'm sorry, I it's my fault, mother. I have not made the point clear. If Article 3 says, for instance, that it will not be introduced unless the president has done ABC. And it is apparent that the president has not done ABC. But ABC gets done on the subsequent date. It's not there on that day. Rajya Sabha passes a bill which it has, which, which it which it is not competent to pass at all, it's not competent to even table or consider under the terms of the constitution. Then that's all I'm trying try to point out. Please just take a look at this. It's a very short. Uh, uh, just a timeline of, of five uh, entries of what happened on 5th and 6th. This is all from you know, the av available in the, and I've given the PDF pages of each of the documents. Just give us what are the dates. You can tell us the dates. Just give us the dates. I, your Lord should you know, we might right be able to handle these it, sheets now. We've got everything in the soft form. I mean, these sheets will just fly around the place. It, it just might the PDF pages. Very well. This will uh, be a part I, of I, our I record. Now, on 5th August 2019, CO 272 is issued by the president, which adds subclause D to clause 4 of article 370, substituting Head. the legislative assembly. Heading? <laughs> that might save your lodges a little time if I can just handle no, it. It's not part of your synopsis, that's what I'm asking. It must be part of your submissions, right? Part of your submission. The written submission. No, the, the, the this timeline is not set out. This is all. It, it's it's in the in the COs and the and the uh, what is in in volume three. It's like a supplementary submission now being sort. You don't want to, you it's know, otherwise it's exactly impossible. It's not a submission. I'm, I I can take your lordships directly to the documents. It's not a. So just tell us now quickly the dates yes, so that yes. we can wrap up now. So when CO two seven two is issued by the president this this merely uh, adds a subclause d which substitutes the legislative assembly for the constituent assembly of the state on the same day this is at volume 3 page 101 let me close with that we'll go through this
Now, on the same day, the second entry, the Lok Sabha, on a reference from the President, this is the phraseology, passes a resolution to accept the JNK reorganization bill presented to it by the President for its views. Now, this is at volume 3, page 104. I'll tell you, Lord Chief, the importance of this. Let me just make the point. Look, this is what's the point of doing this? See, we, you please tell us if we will not go beyond four o'clock. You ask your colleagues whether it's fair to them or not. That's all I'm saying. Um, may, may I just summarize the point in a few you, sentences? One hour was taken. We've given you one hour, 45 minutes. Still, you feel something more as oh, 50, 50 minutes. This is not fair, honestly. If your if your lordships have felt that I have repeated myself in any way or not, nobody has your ration time. Nobody has your ration time. You know, we have given you time. We have summarized it. At some stage, all good things must come to an end. The arguments must come to an end. Let us have the next council now to address this. I, I let let Thank me you. just let me just make the point in two sentences, Nurse. Yeah. The point here is that under uh, the ex, the two explanations did not apply to Jammu and Kashmir until CO three two seventy three got passed on the following day. And, and it was only it was only recommended simultaneously along with the uh, Rajya Sabha passing the, JN, uh, the Lok Sabha passing the JNK Reorganization Act. This is not permissible because until then the Constitution of uh, of India is applicable to Jammu and Kashmir applied. The explanations were not there. Union territories were not uh, were not in the in uh, Article Three as it applied to Jammu and Kashmir. So I'm saying that what, what was tabled and what was passed by the Rajya Sabha purportedly on 5th of August was something clearly contrary to Article 3 itself. So if they are founding their case on Article 3, I submit that that is ultra virus. That's the point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, Mr. Parikh. Well, I'm very grateful of Kashmir. In on 29 30th of September 1944, came together and gave themselves in order manifesto. In manifesto, they said two things we want. We want a constitution for our uh, for Kashmir and then also an economic plan for Kashmir. Now these two things were there. Then they went into the question of Milord, what rights should be given to the children, what rights should be given to the women, what kind of land reform should be there. All that many part was part of manifesto. Now they gave it to the to Milad the uh, to the Raja uh, at the time, and then Maharaja and Maharaja for consideration that this is what we demand, and this is the democratic setup we want in Kashmir. Now this particular manifesto, which Milad is taken as a Magna Carta or constitution, was then accepted in the constitution, and whatever people said ultimately in the manifesto, most of it Milad was included in the constitution. This is known as Milord, the new Kashmir, they call this manifesto. Now, the importance is this, Milord, that the sovereignty rests with the people and they express Milord, their sovereignty in a particular way. This, this is what they want. This is kind of democratic setup they want. Now, this sovereignty was Milord, accepted when the Constituent Assembly was sitting and was translated Milord, ultimately into the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. So there are two things Milord, which emanate from it. Number one is that the sovereignty which rests with the people and they may not expressed it. And that expression was translated ultimately Milord, into the constitution which they gave to unto themselves. That's number one. Second is Milord, when there is a written constitution, then that written constitution is supreme. Now Lordship Sir Milord, noted that judgment in, in uh, Article 143, that privileged case Milord. I'll just give the citation and the para number, which says, my lord, that ultimately in a democratic country, having written constitution, it is the constitution which is supreme and sovereign. That is, my lord, uh, 1965, 1 SCR 414, and it is in volume 17, PDF. It starts at 337 at 357 para 40.
note that in my submissions because it has not come Now, my lord, the uh, second judgment which I just wanted to draw your lordship's attention is, is my lord Bhumi's case, which has been cited before lordships. It is para. So, what is the, what's the, what's the, the conceptualize it? Is the conceptual, my lord, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that this, my lord, the entire idea, people said they want to have a democratic setup. And therefore, they came together, gave themselves, my lord, a manifesto. Manifesto was translation of their wishes or desires that it should be in a particular way. That Milord was given to Maharaja at that particular point of time that please accept it because we want this monarchy to end, we want a democracy to come. So this expression Milord which was given in the manifesto was translated ultimately because as I said it was a Magna Carta and in the discussion also we find that they have is in your Lordship. submission. We so look at the sir, idea sir, is, sir, is yeah. that we look at your submission. I, I, you know, Lordship said formulated. So it's Milord ultimately the sovereignty which vests in the people ultimately transferred Milord in the constitution. As I said, the constitution is supreme and sovereign. Milord, that's the idea. And I, Milord, refer to uh, the two paragraphs. One is Milord in uh, uh, the 1965 judgment, which is para 40, and para 102 and 103. So, Justice Savan's Milord view in Gomai, and if your Lord says permit me, I'll read only para 103, and this particular part will end. In this connection, may I give Milord the, your Lordship the PDF? No, we got it, yes. Yes. This will be PDF 171, 172 of Case Law, Volume 2. Hmm? 272? Uh, 271, 272. Now, 102. Now, 102, Milan. At 271. Yes. Now, the Lordship may uh, skip a lot the earlier para, last, just li last three, four lines. It is true to say that democracy, people are sovereign. All powers belong primarily to people. The retention of such power by the people and the. That's true. These are well. Lord Shisa, read now, Lord, 103 is how the states are formed on the basis of linguistic, ethnic, and that's other not, things, yes. and that cannot be disturbed. Yes. Lord Shisa noted. That's enough, Lord, for me. Now, the only thing is, Lord, that in the book, uh, uh, Justice Anand, Lord, says that as far as the sovereignty is concerned and autonomy, they are, Lord, interchangeable terms that what you call sovereignty is autonomy. Now, that is, Lord, something which is important when we say whether there is autonomy. Autonomy in the form of sovereignty, sovereignty with the people, and ultimately in the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, my lord, with regard to the interpretation of 370, Lord, just have read it number of times. I just wish to point out, my lord, two things. One is, my lord, when we look at 371b and Milord 370d first proviso. These Milord two provisions they talk about the consultation. Rest is concurrence. So my argument is Milord as far as the concurrence is concerned. Concurrence is concerned because the constituent assembly doesn't exist. And I must point out you know, how the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, because that has not been pointed out, how it was dissolved. There was a resolution and pursuant to the resolution, it was dissolved. So therefore, my lord, those parts are concerned. The, the provisions, my lord, in terms of the 1954 presidential order, which has been issued, my lord, I know lordships are probably, if I'm repeating something, then yeah. 1954 presidential order, which is there, 
if you look at the six presidential orders which have been issued, the first one is Millard consultation. There are other three consultation. One is Millard CO44, which is Millard under 373, where Millard the constant assembly's prior recommendation was taken because they changed the explanation there from Millard Maharaja to uh, Sadare Riyasat. So that is Millard one thing which shows that ultimately you require prior recommendation of the constant assembly. The only provision is 1954, which talks about the concurrence. My submission is, my lord, that the concurrence ultimately comes to an end because the constant assembly is not there. But the question arises, my lord, which a lot has put to me, what about the presidential orders which have been issued subsequently? The only answer, my lord, which I think can be given is that all the subsequent presidential orders which have been issued are either some changes, some amendments in the 1954 presidential order. They are not, my lord, because the areas were carved where the uh, union will legislate and the areas, my lord, where the Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir constitution will prevail. Therefore, my lord, all those things which have been issued can be, it can be justified only on this basis that these presidential orders, because 1954 presidential order was issued after Millard, the, uh, the, the uh, concurrence of the constant assembly or approval of the constant assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. Therefore, the subsequent presidential orders which are issued were under the presumption that the constant assembly's approval already exists as far as the presidential. You know, this is one way to look at it because when I try to find out I could get me not any answer because if the constant assembly comes to an end, naturally the entire you know, there is no constant assembly, therefore there can't be any uh, any any concurrence in that sense, which is provided Millard under 370. I have formulated Millard 370. I just read Millard two formulations. 370, I am reading that Millard. Provided the constitutional mechanism by which the instrument or accession was integrated into the constitution of India. Recognized, semicolon, recognized areas where the constitution of India will operate and by respecting will of the people, carved out the areas where the constitution they wish to give unto themselves will prevail. Second is, 370 is temporary in, in the sense that it contained the principles which would govern the for, formation of Indian constitution as applicable to JNK as well as the constitution of JNK. Once that was achieved, the aim and object of 370 was fulfilled. Seeing each other, meeting each other was converted into a relationship on mutually decided terms. It is this relationship which is permanent. This relationship could not be unilaterally altered. It is like a constitutional promise embedded in will of the people. With the dissolution of constant assembly of JNK achieving its purpose of giving birth to the constitution, the temporary provision achieved the permanent result. The other significant permanent feature being that people of JNK accepted JNK with all its territorial limits to be an integral part of India for all times to come. No, my lord, there are two, three documents, my lord, on the basis of which the interpretation of 370 is possible. One is, my lord, the constant assembly debates in India, the constant assembly debates of JNK, and the judgment in Premnath Kaur. Now, from all these three documents, my lord, two, uh, my lord, uh, situations emerge. One is that the constant assembly will have a final say. All, my lord, the debates, as well as debate in Jammu and Kashmir, and Milord the Premnath call judgment says so. That number one, 
constituent assembly will have a final say and number two is relationship will be finally determined by jnk constituent assembly these are the two factors which are which are common milord in the entire thing i just wish milord because the um, sir gopal subramanian had read milord the uh, debates in jammu and kashmir constituent assembly but i just wish to draw your lordship's attention to my submissions 504 just milord look at 512 Yes. Yeah. So my submissions will not, which is in volume one of the submissions, starts from five zero four. Just kindly come to five one two. Yes. And then will not lost it. May skip. This is will not. What Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah makes a statement on 370. The entire paragraph is that. Well, let's just may skip that and come to Milord 514. Just about para 26. The Constitution of Indian Union therefore clearly envisaged the convening of a constituent assembly for Jammu and Kashmir state, which would be finally competent to determine ultimate position of the state in respect of the sphere of its succession. which would be incorporated as in the shape of permanent provisions in the constitution this briefly is the position which constitution india has accorded towards it now this was will not be same thing which you find in the debates will not gopal swami anger he says the same thing same thing we find will not in the judgment of call and this is what so there was will not add item as to what should be the shape and what should govern the relationship between will not jammu and kashmir and india now will not 26 is which has not been shown to your lordships how the ultimately it was dissolved the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir now milord this is uh, the statement which was made by mir kasim he said he said milord whereas the constituent assembly came into being for framing the constitution for the state whereas the constituent assembly has enacted and adopted the constitution for the state now therefore this assembly resolves Shall stand dissolved on 26th day of January 1957, which is the date of commencement of the Constitution. Sir, I would like to make a brief submission with regard to this resolution. The resolution aims at dissolving the Constituent Assembly by passing and adopting the Constitution, which will come into force on 26th January. The Assembly has done its primary and main function, and it is but natural that it would stand dissolved. legally it could not have been dissolved by any authority because people elected this assembly for a specific object now the object having been achieved it is reasonable to dissolve it by way of a resolution hence the resolution this assembly is not capable of protecting the constitution it had only the mandate of framing and enacting the constitution for the state and nothing more now i can we can skip the entire thing milord and finally on the next page the last four or five lines mr president the question is whether the constituent assembly came into being for framing the constitution of the state whereas the constituent assembly is enacted they adopted the constitution now therefore this assembly resolves it should stand dissolved on 26 january which is the date of commencement of the constitution and we close the business and then milord after this cross cross is milord the proceedings on 26th of january 1957 mr president today this historic session ends with this the constituent assembly is dissolved according to the resolution passed on 17th november 1956 clock struck 12 pm and constituent assembly was dissolved by the president according to the resolution adopted on 17th now i thought i must draw your lordship's attention to this important part how it was dissolved now milord as i have read milord on 370 my i am not going into milord the sampath prakash and other arguments which i am skipping because all that has been argued 
Now, Lord Shishma only look at one part, two parts actually. The uh, presidential order, my Lord, which was passed on in 1954, had expressly, my Lord, excluded articles 356, 357, and 316. Kindly look at me, Lord. Lordships have seen that, aware of that. That is vol volume 3, page 18. Now, these were expressly excluded, and because they were excluded, it was with the understanding that as far as there is a breakdown of constitutional machinery in Jammu and Kashmir, then ultimately it will be taken care of under the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, and they brought in section 92 for that particular purpose. Now, thereafter, Milord, the, and this was with the concurrence, which, Milord, my argument, if it is accepted, then after that, no change was possible, because 92 had already come into operation, which took care of the entire situation. Now, 356 was brought in by virtue of CO 71 in 1965. Now, Lord Shishma Market, this is page 37, if you Lord, Lord Shishma want to see volume 3. Now, 357 was not adopted, 357 was, was not brought into, it is only 356. So one question which arises is, we have to uh, uh, question that what is the implication ultimately of 357 not being there? I, I hope I am clear, Milad. Uh, if you just want to note down the pages, I can. Yes. No. Milad, that 54 presidential order, just show me that. What I am trying to point out is this, that the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, at that time, finally when the, finally the situation, was not, 356 was not there, subsequently, 356 has been made applicable. No, not what I'm trying to say is, I can show the debates. When 92 uh, was inserted, section 92, what were the debates, my lord, in the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir? What I'm trying to show is the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir ultimately approved that 356, 357, 360 will not be there. And therefore, my lord, 92 came into, up, into being. So 92 provided for the situation because 92, equivalent of 92 doesn't exist for as far as other states are concerned. Thereafter, my lord, the changes were made, and in 1965, 356 was inserted, brought in, said wherever constitution is mentioned, you read it as constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. 357 was not brought in. Now, if you look, my lord, read 356, it says that you give parliament ultimately or to the president. Under 357 alone, that the orders can be passed or law can be made. Can you look at 357, my lord? This will also have a bearing on my lord section T, but I am not going to those parts. Now, 357 says, we are by a proclamation issued under clause 1 of article 356. It has been declared that power of the legislature of the state shall be exercisable by or under the authority of parliament. It shall be competent for the parliament to confer on president the power of legislature to make laws, authorize the president to delegate, subject to such conditions as he may think fit, for parliament or the president in whom such powers are vested to make laws conferring powers for imposing duties. I will take your lordships, my lord, through the yes. governor's pro proclamation 92. Yes. Article 357 has not been made applicable. It has not been made applicable. And therefore, Though Parliament can assume to itself the power of the state legislature to enact laws, yes. you cannot further delegate it to the President. Correct. You cannot do that. That's not my argument. And kindly, my Lord, 
uh, see uh, the proclamation which was issued on 20th of June 2018. Just look at that, Milan. That proclamation, Milad, is at page, volume 3, page 85. I am saying, Milad, that there is a machinery which existed to take care of the constitutional background. And I am quoting again Justice Anand's book because he says, relying upon number of judgments which are given by, Milad, the Jammu and Kashmir High Court, whether it is, we can reconcile both. And the argument is, yes, we can reconcile. But the question is, ultimately, 92 acts in a particular sphere and 356 acts in a different sphere altogether. You can reconcile, it can exist. But the question is, they operate in different fields. And once you exercise power under 92, and you say, we are dissolving, and look at me not the, uh, this particular proclamation, which is me not at page 85, just look at it, me not, I'll, in 92. And I'm asking myself why 356 was not issued initially. It could have been done. Why they resorted to 92? An answer will also come, my Lord. Answer is because after the proclamation, on the next date, he dissolves, my Lord, the assembly by resorting to section 53 2B, which could not have been done without the aid and advice of the council ministers. Why it was done, my Lord? Because it is dissolved. And then you take over ultimately. Now, proclamation will not say powers conferred by 92, enabling me in that behalf of the concurrence of the. Now, one important factor I must mention. I am so sorry, I have to hurry up, my Lord, otherwise, necessary for me to show. But because Lordships are aware, I am going on that basis. Section 92 says, my Lord, concurrence of the President. So naturally, when this uh, proclamation was issued, there was proclamation. It says so. There is a pro proclamation of President of India. Now he gives me Lord the concurrence to the proclamation which was issued, the President. And after that, me Lord, certain provisions are suspended. He says any reference to any reference to state constitution or acts or made by the legislature shall be construed as including reference or acts made by me. That is on page uh, uh, para 5. In exercise of powers of legislature of the state under the proclamation made under such and such. So assumes, Milord, on that date itself, the powers to make the laws. Now, can, Milord, look at this one and 357. How you reconcile both the things. And next day, Milord, He says, power vested upon me under 92.1, exercise of powers under 53.2b of the Constitution, Jammu I have I dissolved the Legislative Assembly. Now, 350, 50, section 53.2b, if we read, my Lord, section, I think, 35, that this can be done. 92, you can exercise without the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers, but 53, you cannot do, which is necessary. So, he does, my Lord, a thing which is absolutely unconstitutional act. It was impermissible to do it. But my, my argument here is, if you watch this, my Lord, I can give certain, there's a discussion by Justice Anand in his book about how these two provisions can work in Kashmir. That is volume 7, 17, PDF, my Lord at 143, 144. So, my submission is, in this situation, it was not permissible for the President will not to invoke the powers under 356 because under 92 and 92 is something which was approved ultimately by the constitution of our India and also the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir 
is a malefactory excess of power and a fraud, which may not, I don't want to go into the judgments. Now, may not my uh, probably last, I must say, argument is with regard to CO 272 and 273. Just kindly have a look at, and the argument will be very brief. Kindly look at Milord 272 at page, I think, PDF 101. Lord Shittar put a question to Mr. Sibbal. This is 5th of August 2019 and 6th Milord is the final order which has been issued CO273. I must say Milord before I go to 272 is that 273 assumes Milord the fact that the prior recommendation of constant assembly is necessary. If we understand that way Milord then kindly look at it. It means if you want to make any change in 370 as such which we draw a lot from CO44, which I pointed out, where you change the explanation. That's the only thing, Milord, which the Constituent Assembly approved. Now, here, Milord, what they do is that through the interpretation clause, provision, they, Milord, indirectly change 370 itself. Kindly look at, Milord, this one. To 367 shall be added the following clauses. Losses may skip A. A says construed as references to such and such and such. B is references to person for the time being recognized by President, recommendation of assembly. Sadar Yasat, acting on advice of Council of Minister of State for the time being in office, shall be construed as references to Jammu and Kashmir. Now, exactly the same words which are used in the explanation. So, they are changing without the explanation without the uh, prior recommendation of constant assembly. And look at Milord below that. In proviso D, 3 of 370 expression constant assembly of state 2 shall be read as registered assembly of the state. Now, I I ask myself that how this is possible that you can change 370 as such by virtue of the interpretation when you recognize in the very next order which was issued that constant assembly's prior recommendation is necessary. So, this interpretation, Middle Lordships are asked why this interpretation without this interpretation also something was possible. This interpretation was resorted to because they wanted to show the exercise ultimately done by them by CO273 is something which is constitutional nature. That is to say that they have done this thing after prior recommendation of the Constituent Assembly. So how they may not achieve it, they changed 370 to the interpretation clause. Absolutely may not unconstitutional act. And after doing this, I, I hope I am clear Milo. After doing this, then may not the final order is uh, given what it says, CO 273. In exercise of powers conferred by clause 3 of 370, read with clause 1 of 370 of the constitution, the president on recommendation of parliament. So may not the recommendation of the constituent assembly after that was substituted by recommendation of parliament. is pleased to declare as from the certain all clauses of the 370 shall cease to operate. So what they do is they know without constant assembly they can they cannot do constant assembly is not there. They bring in through the interpretation indirectly and my submission is what you cannot do directly you cannot do indirectly. That's again a fraud on the constitution. The followed me not. This argument has been raised. It, it was I am so sorry. The, because I think I was attending all the in, in, in this because Lord Shiva put a question to Mr. Sibal, what's the meaning of this interpretation clause? Why they resorted to interpretation? They resorted to interpretation because they could not have done directly with 370. Therefore, they resorted to, and after making change, came out Milord with this one on the recommendation of parliament. Now, other question, which is a prior recommendation, according to 373. It is prior recommendation of constant assembly. It has to be prior recommendation. Now, kindly look at on 5th of August, this notification, uh, notification is issued. How, my lord, next day a prior recommendation of parliament was sought? On the face of it, my lord, it looks obvious 
that this is something may not which is not permissible the entire exercise may not shows that is malafide in nature so therefore may not this goes 272 goes the other may not proclamations which are issued they thank also you. go thank you mr akari thank you i may not it becomes very difficult sometimes because i know because you read a lot chip by chip may not things are removed few chips remain may not then you have to sustain yourself on those chips so probably i do not sir, have done whatever thank you sir pari it's the same not more than 7 8 minutes yes we are fast as possible now just three points i want to highlight proposition being a more restrictive and uh, uh, strict approach in interpreting article 370 for three reasons i am taking the broader view because the nuts and bolts have been gone into the first reason is historical the second is jurisprudential and the third is in terms of the constitutional ethos the historical part my lord which i'd like to emphasize for a more restricted and strict interpretation is that the region consisted of a muslim majority and the population my lords had a choice between either going into pakistan or into india either being a majority in a, in, in pakistan or choosing to take a minority status in india Malots chose the latter, and Malots, the although the historical part has been dealt with about the signing of the instrument of accession, just a few pages I'll highlight to show how it was Sheikh Abdullah who represented and who had a hold over the population at that time, who was responsible for this transition to India, and therefore Malots, one of the important points which I'd like to make is that if there is a choice, a conscious choice made to remain a minority. in a region in the backdrop of the horrific violence of partition malus when there is a constitutional promise in the in the nature of article 370 it should be strictly construed that's my first point and malus the in in regard to that malus may i just point out two or three pages vp menon's book on the integration of the nation state i'll just point out the pages so that i don't take time malus page uh, at volume 50 1515 pdf page 1258 where it just mentions that sheikh abdullah rose to power to fight for the rights of the muslim community by 1939 the body had shed its communal complexion and changed its name to national conference he had a considerable hold over the people of the state that is bp menon's uh, book at page 1258 then my lords may see page 1259 pdf the maharaja was assured by lord mount batten that if he acceded to pakistan india would not take it amiss and that it had a firm assurance of this from sardar patel himself lord mount batten went on to say that in view of the composition of the population it was important to ascertain the wishes of the people this is pdf page 1259 volume 15 the situation for the maharaja was not easy this is again menon pointing out if he acceded to pakistan the non muslims of jammu and ladakh as well as considerable section of muslims led by national conference would have resented such an action that is page Uh, 1259 pdf page 1259 volume 15 the government of india had no territorial ambition in kashmir if the raid by the tribes had not taken place government of india would have left kashmir alone that is at page 1271 pdf volume 15 the tribal invasion was not a spontaneous affair engineered by pakistan that is at page 1271 volume 15 the accession was legally made by the maharaja of kashmir and this is important and the step was taken with the advice of sheikh abdullah that is pdf page 61 volume 20 this is ag nurani's book malus this is not uh, uh, up to now i was stating uh, mr menon's book this is ag nurani and then my lords may see on 27 10 in reply to the request for accession by the maharaja the governor general of india mount batten clearly stated that the issue of accession should be decided in accordance with the wishes of the people as soon as law and order had been restored in kashmir this is pdf page 59 volume 20 in the context of these historical facts both nehru and sardar patel were of the clear view that jammu and kashmir should decide their own consequences see letter of jawahar lal nehru dated 18th of march 1949 pdf page 67 volume 20 this is again ag nurani's book it is in this context my lord that 370 emerges so my lords my first submission is this in this context that when there is a conscious choice made in this manner my lords all the more reason why it should be taken strictly and in this context may i just point out sr bombay 
at page 218, PDF page 218, volume 2, which says that federalism is not seen merely as a matter of administrative convenience, but one of the principal outcomes of our own historical process and a recognition of ground reality. And my lord, this leads to what is called asymmetric federalism, my lords, which has been extensively dealt with by my lords in the uh, N uh, um, NCT uh, judgment too. It is also, my lords, in fact, uh, one of the persons, first persons who coined the term asymmetric federalism for in the Indian context was Professor Balbir Arora from Sorbonne, and he was also the professor for political science in JNU. And his book, my lords, which is at page 242 to 243 PDF page, volume 17 of the document compilation, where he talks about the nature of asymmetric federalism, which was there, which is to take into account different regional aspirations. And um, it has a remarkable degree of flexibility and pragmatism. It is a calibrated institutional response to the diversity of constitutional unit permeating both de facto and de jure variation. My Lord, thereafter, my Lord, may I just point out the above fact that the, it, is, it is an anti-majoritarian or a protection against majoritarian that asymmetric federalism provides. And in that context, my lords, our constitution is also a, 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 a anti-majoritarian in many ways, my lords. There are lots of judgments which have dealt with it. I put it at point E.3 point of my written statement at page 500. That is E.3 of my written statement. Then, my lords, Keshanan Bharti case at para 208, PDF page 151, volume 15, where I point out that where, where it is emphasized that in case there is a um, uh, it, it, it quotes my lord the case and I just I'll just quote it. I may mention that the Judicial Committee, while interpreting British North America Act 1867, had also kept in mind the preservation of the rights of minorities, for they say in the regulation and control of aeronautics in Canada. The British North America Act embodies a compromise under which the original provinces agreed to federate. It is important to keep in mind that the preservation of the rights of minorities was the conditions on which such minorities entered into the federation and the foundation upon which the whole structure was subsequently erected. The process of interpretation as the years go on ought not to be allowed to dim or whittle down the provisions of the original contract upon which the federation was founded, nor is it legitimate that any judicial construction should impose a new and different contract. This is echoed in Jindal Steel case at 2017 12 SCC 1, that is PDF page 219 to 220, where it is very clearly pointed out again, it reiterates Keshavnan Bharti that the original terms should not be whittled down. And so, my lords, the argument that so called hollowing out of the Article 370 through various orders which have taken place, already Mr. Nafri has argued that there was no hollowing out, the core remained. But assume that there was a hollowing out which takes place, it is a political act. And Malad has been very clear in this entire proceedings that we are interpreting the constitution. So if because of a political act, there is a so-called hollowing out, which is without prejudice to that argument, I, I do not accept that it is. But if there is a if such as the case, even then that should not affect the interpretation of the provisions of Article uh, uh, 370. Then Malad may uh, Pordual case again highlights the aspect of asymmetric federalism, which I will not go into. Malad, the second point briefly. What are the limits, my lords, if you are looking at the broad approach, what are the limits by which we will determine what are the limits of a constitutionally vested power? And my lords, the answer is uh, the analogy of uh, Mill's famous uh, thing on liberty, that your liberty ends where the other man's nose begins. So the moment there is a constitutional, fundamental constitutional principle which is there, which is getting affected, the limit must be there. And my lords, in that context, the NCT judgment case, there are two pages I'll just point out, PDF page 92 at para 108 volume 5 and PDF page 35 at para 40 uh, volume 14. Pilots, also there is the G, uh, Miller case that is at uh, PDF page 324 of volume 5, recent Miller case in the UK in the context of proroguing uh, of the house, where again this concept is put forward. So it's an international constitutional concept which is also equally applicable here. It has been reiterated by various uh, judgments in India. My lords, I would also urge that if we are talking about minority rights, if you are talking about anti-majoritarian or protection against majoritarian, my lords, there is the LGBTQ plus judgments, etc., which are coming. There is an evolution which is taking place. 
with respect my lords this kind if if one were to do away with this thing which involves historically a religious minority not that they are necessarily expecting if that is there my lords it will be a regressive step and my lords in in line with what is happening in line with in which the evolution is taking place more and more inclusiveness is there it should not be there i'd like to finally end my lords i won't uh, take more time i'd like to end by pointing out one or two quick points one is my lords in our rejoinder at page 88 the niti ayog report is there now my lords there is no material which has been brought on on why 356 was imposed my lords that has always all been argued but the material of the government which is already there on record it says in peace security effective governance based on rule of law and upholding principles of equality jammu and kashmir rises above a number of states and my lords that i put at page 88 at volume 13 of the niti ayog report page 282 of volume 13 at page 286 and page 285 this is prior to abdul so my lords the, the this further kind of deepens the mystery and of course there are uh, there are statements made by ex constitutional authorities not of much relevance now that the, he's not holding a constitutional post but how it was exercised but when this was the case if kashmir was a leader it is it's used as a leader in these areas where was the need for a 356 malox finally one last uh, anomaly which my learned friend had also pointed out and that is i'll just point out that is volume 3 sorry just malox just a minute just on the reorganization i'm sorry yes malox we come to section 57 malox the botched up kind of situation which is arising now with this of course the reorganization act is consequential i understand but still malox i may just point this out 57 at pdf page 126 volume 3 malox it says not withstanding anything to the contrary contained in any law document judgment ordinance rule regulation or notification on and from the appointed date the legislative council of the existing state of jammu and kashmir shall stand abolished on abolition of legislative council every member shall cease to be etc so it abolishes the legislative council now malox what is peculiar is just before this the co272 is 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 passed co272 applies all the provisions of the constitution when you are talking about abolishing the legislative council then it has to be as per section 169 of the constitution of india which is already stands applied on pursuant to co272 once that is applied then man of what happened it can't, it can't be done away by this by way of this act so we've already challenged the validity of this act but man of this is like a trishanku legislative council which which has not been abolished by any proper procedure which is prescribed by law so my lord that was the uh, point and there was one more point uh, 73 my lord is that my lord clause which has come even by way of amendment in the in the context of the delhi government also that if the president on receipt of a lieutenant governor my lord the same powers as 356 but no time limit provided i am very grateful my lords and i am extremely grateful that my lords had this uh, the technology which enabled us even many times even while you were not present in court we could keep in touch with thank you deep your blessing yes mr ram krishna president one of the major political parties and was heading the government at the time of governor's rule and i have held office i formed the government twice before i was a single major party and i am therefore i would venture to suggest much more representative of legislative will than that ersad and duplicitous reference in co272 to the legislative assembly i also represent uh, writ petitioners in writ petition 1099 where mr ramachandran was appearing petitioners 3 4 and 5 As far as I'm concerned, I appear for PDP. I don't know you? what this is. Who are you? Who are you? You know the, this reputation one zero double nine was initially filed by six people. Then two of them withdrew. Dr. Shah Kassan and then I don't know what he's talking about. Then the red petition number one, who is Mr. Uh, Javed Bak. Javed Bak when he engaged. Uh, my learned friend, the president, senior counsel, Raja Ramachandran, would be arguing the matter. When he came to know, 
that he has withdrawn from the battle, then he contacted a senior lawyer from Kashmir, Mr. Muzaffar Hussain Bey, who, in fact, I didn't know anything of this. I'm but sorry. Let can... me represent PDP, the impeachment application. My lord will hear him we whenever it can. We are not PDP. Yes, I'm arguing for PDP now. My lord will hear me. First. That's an intervener application for the merit in merit petition. Farooq but in the petitioner number one, when he engaged them, then the understanding was that Mr. Dada Ramachandran could be arguing the matter. When he withdrew from the case, blood, then Javed Bhatt petitioner number one, he approached uh, Mr. Mijabur Hussain Bhairbe. So we, 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 we have filed the Kalkana that perhaps not has been placed on the board because of uh, some time timeline issues. May I, may I clarify? So what's the picture is blood? That yeah. petition number one in red petition number 1099, Mr. Muzaffar Hussain, they would be arguing, of course, with the permission of my lord. See, ordinary, there's no difficulty, but normally for all of the entire group of petitioners in a petition, you presume that they are sailing together. That's Therefore, one lawyer would appear for all the petitioners. For different respondents, different lawyers can appear, but for People who join together in a petition. May I? If there is, if there is some conflict within the petitioner, somebody has to get transposed or file another another proceeding. That, that conflict arose because of desire of Mr. Raja Ramachandran. May I? May I? May I make a clarification, Your Lordship? This. There this was for factual clarity. Red petition one zero nine nine was filed by how many people? By uh, may, may I? Just one may second. I? He's in charge. I, one I, second. I yeah. I I instructed in the matter, Your Lordship. There were initially seven people, yes. of which Dr. Shah Faisal and Ms. Shaila Rashid had subsequently withdrawn. Mr. Ramchandran, in fact, uh, argued their applications for withdrawal, and this was allowed by this court. So, so we left there, with there, five. There were five. There was there was um, one Mr. Javed Ahmed Bhatt. His was the his was petitioner number one, who became the petitioner number one after Dr. Shah Faisal's withdrawal. So last evening. I re I received a request saying that there has to be a way in which we had another arguing counsel, the team. And this was because this was contrary to the express orders of the court where it had said that the thing, uh, all the petitioner's arguments had to be wrapped up today and that a certain list was had. So despite and, and therefore I deemed it unreasonable to have to have to uh, accede to that request at that time. And I had indicated that they are free to pursue their remedies, whatever they have. And they had therefore requested uh, no objection, on which I had a separate, very detailed release covenant that, that I had in fact uh, received from the petitioner, where in the detailed release covenants, he had covenanted that these hearings would not be interrupted. And after the hearing plan is over, if anything, the, with the permission of with the permission of the court, he may take the, that 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 is ex because as also the nodal council we owe duty to the court that the, the just one second the one second the other mic ban kar I don't want to appear for anybody in this red petition. I will just appear for PDP. Yes, I don't want to appear for anybody. Uncouth to interrupt like <laughs> In your the petition which you are arguing, it is 1099. You are the first counsel to argue, right? Yes, because Mr. Ramachandran requested me. Right, right. In this, in the last three weeks, you are the first person who is arguing this matter. Correct. Until yesterday, I thought I was arguing for all the all the petitioners. And just, but I'm happy to just please keep quiet. I'm arguing for PDP definitely. Yes. And let me argue for them. If my friend who he represents in that petition, I don't. Uh, now, Mr. Counsel, what you are suggesting is that Mr. Muzaffar, Mr. Muzaffar Hussain Beg will appear for Mr. Javed Bhatt. Yes, ma'am. Now, you see, there's only one difficulty. See, we want to be fair. We don't want to shut out any voice. It's our duty to give a fair hearing to all, all, all perspectives. At the same time, you're also conscious as a member of the bar that in a petition, when a group of petitioners have come together, 
one lawyer appears for all the petitioner. There may be a little conflict or di diverging interest between respondents. And therefore, respondents are entitled to have separate representation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we are more than willing to hear Mr. Bake's perspective. The way to do it is then Mr. Bhatt, Mr. Javed Bhatt will perhaps have to withdraw from that petition 1099. And we'll permit Mr. Bake to make a brief representation as an intervener. We can do that. Ultimately, it's a question of yours of, of being heard by the Supreme Court, isn't it? It's one of that. Too. And, and she, she has very gracious. So, uh, Ms. She Ram, very gracious Ms. Ramkrishnan. That, that she would be representing. Uh, Ms. Ramkrishnan. Now, the remaining five petitioners in 1099. Uh, who are those five petitioners? Is PDP its uh, party no, in that? PDP, 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 PDP. Just, just one second. PDP is an impeachment application. She is an impleader. Because she was in jail. She was in imprisonment when so all she, these petitions were. Her happened. application is for impeachment. Yes. As a petitioner. Yes. But the others have to agree to her impeachment. They have agreed. They have no objection. Not impeachment. Not for petition. As petitioner, Manod. She wants to be impeached. Correct. Who but represents the other uh, four? One of them, that this is a new development, but uh, just, just one second, one second. Who's for the other four now? The or the other five? Because actually, there are five now left. Shah Faisal withdrew, and, and likewise, Miss Shella Afridi uh, withdrew. Now, who's appearing for the remaining five? Miss <coughs> Ramprishnan, are you appearing? Forget Javed Bhatt's case for a moment. We'll say the remaining four. Apart from appearing for the PDP, are you representing the four as well? I was given to understand that until this minute. But even at this minute, he is representing. If so, we take it apart from the impleader, intervener, uh, which is the PDP. You are appearing for the remaining four, yeah. and you have instructions to appear for that. Yes, yes, by the advocate on record. All right. Now, in so far as Mr. Javed Bhatt is concerned, Mr. is in Calcutta. Yes, okay. We will, what we'll do is we'll complete the submissions of uh, Ms. Nitya Ramkrishnan. Rest assured that we will give a, let's see how things progress. Okay. Hmm? All right. We got the point. Now, yes. Yes, Mr. Ramkrishnan. I'll try and speak in bullet points. But then only one thing. Do we take it that you, uh, Mr. Javed, but seeks to withdraw from this petition so as to allow him a separate intervention? Oh, no. He's not withdrawing as a petitioner. But then if he is not withdrawing as a petitioner, we are trying to create some space for you. If he is not withdrawing as a petitioner, then the advocate on record will appear for him. How can you have a different counsel appearing? Because he has, he has uh, obtained an NOC and the reason as a... When, uh, when did he obtain the when NOC? When did you obtain the NOC? When did you obtain the NOC? Please tell us. Yes, when, you can't do that. When the matter on the last yes. date of hearing you obtain the NOC, then you say, now I want to appear for that one individual petitioner. He will continue to be the petitioner while four others or five others are represented by another council. Because I was background or no background, we are not this background not or not much earlier. In any case, one thing is very clear even in a normal civil appeal, we will not permit people to withdraw in the course of a submission. And not when a matter has gone on for three weeks. This we will not permit. You, we will please understand the position in law. We will go strictly by the position in law. We will give you an opportunity. It should Javed but not wish to continue any further with Ms. Ramachandran's or Ramkrishna's petition. No difficulty. We will permit him to dealing himself and we will give him a separate hearing. But he cannot be a part of that petition and say there will be two lawyers arguing for them because there may be a conflict of arguments on that which is not permissible in a petition. We saw that for instance Mr. Dwedi adopted a different line but he couldn't do it because he was in a different petition. And as I submitted, I, I, I beg to reiterate not the situation arose only when Mr. Javed Bhatt came to know that Mr. Raja Ramachandran is not arguing the matter. But that is so for the last three weeks. Yes. Everybody knew that he is not going to be appearing for the last three weeks. He didn't appear. And who was not appearing in the best? Uh, well, the first, first hearing two years ago, he opened the argument. Three of us were party to the bench. He is the one who had opened the argument. This is now it was said thereafter that. For whatever reason, Mr. Sibyl now started it. He was not available. Now, suddenly, in the last state of hearing, at the last nth minute, you say, that not only at the nth minute, you interrupt and say, well, I, I want to sail in some other boat. 
Yeah. All right, we'll cut through all this. Above all, we are we are absolutely sure in our mind that we want to give an opportunity to different perspectives because we have to be duly apprised on all sides, different perspective, different points, different points of view. As we said, even within the petitioners, there were different shades of constitutional argument. We'll not shut anybody out. We will hear, but let's follow the correct procedure in law. Let's not set down procedures which are wrong. Mr. Attorney General, we'd like your assistance on this. Forget now that you are. Will that be a proper procedure, Mr. Attorney? I think so. Yes, Mr. Ambush. All this happened to me. Um, I, if I may just, I don't know who to do. I came over the week. Mr. Baker, please rest assured. We'll hear you. No difficulty at all. Hmm? Please be in the court, Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, you can be in the court. You don't have to leave. You can be in the court now. We'll hear you after. You can be in the court. Here. Please give one, ask one of the juniors to give a chair to Mr. Bake so that he can sit down. Yes. Yes, Mr. Well, I'll try to make my arguments in bullet points, so I'm quick. The first point I wish to make is that integration is neither a linear concept nor a quantitative concept. There is a spoken and unspoken assumption that Article 370 is temporary in anticipation of some greater anticipation. It's neither a linear, linear concept. Nor a quantitative one. My friends on the other side. Yes. It looks like we're going to the lunch room. Since we are six or seven minutes short uh, of uh, four o'clock, and there's an event at the bar in the evening, others we could have continued till five, five thirty. Uh, you are going to argue on Article three fifty six. No, I was going to argue on integration, shared sovereignty, and the political context in which this happened, because it's directly relevant to our judging it. Let me suggest one thing. Can you put down what you really have to just to so that it brings clarity to us? We are also at the end of the argument, so there's a tendency to be just jaded by the length of submissions. If you can put everything down on one page, just formulate exactly what you are. And then, you know, for every submission, you can cover yourself in about two minutes so that we have some clarity on what you're arguing. That's what I have That's in mind, but we don't fair want enough. it in writing. Just a page or so. Just give us a page. No, give it to us tomorrow morning. Hmm, a page. Tomorrow morning. Now, Dr. Guruswami, on delimitation, we are not going to hear this because delimitation is not an issue at all which arises here. It was challenged and it is confirmed by this honorable court. Justice calls judgment, yes. I know justice calls it. On internal sovereignty. Sovereignty, not repeating any argument. And not on delimitation. That's likewise. So what we'll do is we'll likewise request you to formulate your points on just a page hmm, on internal sovereignty, right? Uh, then Mr. Manish Tiwari, what would you be arguing? You are going to Northeast, how can we hear it in this matter? and bring about the reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir and its implications qua the Northeast because 370 is succeeded by 371 and there are asymmetric guarantees which were given and those guarantees have implications in national security because the constitution while being a legal, legal political document also performs a very important national security function in terms of integrating the periphery and the so let us let us formulate it like this what you want to really argue is that the impact of the argument which would be propounded by the other side on other similar provisions of the constitution what what uh, your lordship similar provision what i want to submit is 
that there is already a process which has been adopted by Parliament in terms of abrogating 317. So therefore, there's a precedent in place. And that precedent has implications qua the other guarantees in the Constitution, especially with regard to the Northeastern state. So those are the implications which I would like to point out, and I would not take more than 15 minutes of your time. And I assure you it will be it, it would not be a waste likewise, of your time. Likewise, likewise, what we would suggest is if you can put it down on this evening on a one page. I would do that. Then we'll have clarity on exactly what the focus is. All right. Then what about Ms. Farasat? Uh, your Malice in law, it's a point for anyone. And one, in fact, one proposition has been asked, has been asking, clarifying, and a quick point on federalism. All right, Ms. Farasad, we'll, uh, you can also uh, reduce your, what you have to say on uh, a piece of paper. On who's, where's the Nodi Council? By the evening, please put, put together all this. And give soft copies to the uh, court master, what we are now proposing to do. Yes, sir. Then, what about Mr. Irfan Lone? Yes, Lord Chair. You are for the intervening? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, very briefly, I will not. Uh, you are on federalism. Federalism, rule of law, and Fair enough. Uh, Just, democracy. Fair enough. Because Just, that is the soul of the constitution. Absolutely, no difficulty. Just the modalities. Put it down on a sheet of paper so that we'll have clarity on what you're arguing because now we have had arguments before you, so we'll know exactly what is it that is different that you are arguing. It's not true. We are given only 10 minutes, so within... Dr. Z. A. Bhatt. Now, malice in law is being argued by Varisha Farasat also. There is something very important things which have been left out. All right, one page, you can please uh, put it down on, on paper, you know, on a page this evening, and give it to the nodal council. We'll hear you for five minutes or so. And finally, Mr. Gopal Shankarnarayan. Tell your lordships candidly. Now, what we will do, what we'll do is this. We'll get come back to you. Yes. Mr. Ramakrishnan, we'll give you 10 minutes tomorrow to formulate. Uh, Dr. Guruswami, we'll give you exactly 10 minutes to formulate tomorrow. Mr. Tiwari, we'll give you 10 minutes to, once you put it down on paper. If you can all circulate it to the court master by... 8 o'clock this evening, we'll all have an opportunity to read what you have written by early morning tomorrow. Uh, and then everybody else, after Mr. Vattivari, Varisha Farasat, Irfan Lohan, and Zede Bhatt, we'll uh, give you five minutes uh, each to uh, conclude your submissions once you put it down on paper. Ten minutes, Lordship. Uh, Lordship, Mr. Minutes. Shankar Narayan, after they have all concluded, we'll give you the uh, wrap up word on the. Hmm? Lordship, the earlier list indicates the 10 minutes. So. You know, time is over already this evening. We have already permitted. So, Gopal, be ready tomorrow. Uh, we will hear you, uh, uh, Mr. Mo Mr. Bay, if you can give us likewise, say by uh, 8 o'clock today, a note not exceeding two pages on what your line of uh, submissions is, please have the note circulated to the nodal council, who is just to your right here, next to uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, so that that note will be circulated to all the members of the bench by tonight. But do put down what you have to say on a note in two pages. And we will hear you right before uh, Mr. Gopal Shankar Narayan. Hmm? So now the order will be, Ms. Ramakrishnan is in, uh, in, in session of the proceedings now. Thereafter, Dr. Guruswami, Mr. Manish Tiwari, Ms. Farasat, Mr. Lone, Mr. Zaidi Bhatt, uh, then Mr. Muzaffar Hussain Beg, and then Mr. Shankar Narayan. Do you want to hear Mr. Beg before or soon after? You don't get...